All right, it's uh, 6.35, we'll call uh, this meeting to order and we'll start off by having a Pledge of Allegiance. Let's I brief it. All right, I'd just like to welcome everybody that's here tonight. Thank you for coming. Uh, moving along, uh, we will look for an approval of the agenda. Mr. President. Yes, Ms. Pearson. I move to approve the agenda as presented. Second. All right, we have a motion by Ms. Peterson and a second by Mr. Farr to approve that agenda. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, it passes six to zero. Next, I'm looking for an approval of the March 28, 2023 uh, board meeting minutes. Mr. President. Ms. Peterson. I move to approve the 328 23 minutes. Second. All right, so I have a motion by Ms. Pearson and a second by Ms. Farr to approve the minutes from March 28, 2023. Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? I, I wasn't here for that meeting. March 28th? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I approve. <laughs> okay, so it passes six to zero. All right. An approval. Item number six is an approval of the minutes from our December 3rd, 2021 uh, special meeting. Uh, Mr. President. Yes, Ms. Pearson. I move to approve the minutes of the 12 3 21 minutes. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Peterson and a second by Ms. Lyons to approve the minutes from December 3rd, 2021. Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, I would assume that we're at that meeting, signify by saying aye. 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 All right, so that passes four to zero with two, what would it be, abstention, I guess? Okay. All right, moving on to item number seven, uh, board member reports. Mr. Farr, let's start with you. Um, I had a really good walkthrough at Burning School yesterday with Mr. Logan and Mr. Workman. Um, obviously, we are right in the heart of SBAC testing, so we were trying to be as delicate as possible, and the, but the staff and the administrators were very accommodating to us, and uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. That's all I had to report. Thank you, Mr. Hendricks. <laughs> Mr. Hendricks. Thank you, President Cooey. I attended the career fair at Burnley High School. It was a tremendous success. Nicole Taylor and Rod Jacobson did a great job putting it on. There are many trades and other career choices for students to choose from, and the students packed the gym, exploring their opportunities. I also attended the National School Board Association Conference to learn how other school districts around the country are promoting education. It was interesting to see how other districts institute some of the same programs we have here. I was able to network with other districts from neighboring states, and as a result, um, I've been talking to some of them. It's also good to build relationships from people from other districts around our state. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hendricks. Um, this is Mrs. Barson, and um, let's see. Uh, I guess first thing I want to talk about is the gym. The beautiful gym is going up finally. We're all so excited about it. And um, the other thing was, of course, the kids are busy with track, and I want to give... Uh, 
a shout out to Gopher Construction because they were asked for some sand uh, in the morning, and we had it for our long and triple jump by the afternoon. So I do want to thank them. I'm sure it's going to be coming up next week on the next month on the thank you. But I did want to thank them for that. All right, thank you, Ms. Parsons. Uh, Ms. Peterson? Yeah, <clears throat> hi. Um, a couple of fun things I got to do this month. Um, I went out and helped the intermediate school discus throwers measure their throws. <clears throat> and it was really fun because it was so windy. It was like a nightmare. But that, but the interacting with the kids was really great and really fun. And I love track. Um, I participated in track in high school. So, um, And then I also went to Dayton High School. Um, one night they had presentation from somebody who talked to the kids about internet safety and I was really appreciative of that and I'm glad that we're talking to the kids about dangers online and what they should not be posting and so um, that is it for today thank you thank you for the slide thank you I had the wonderful opportunity to go be a mystery reader for at the Yarrington Elementary School um, and then afterwards read in a couple of different classes and went from second, third, fourth grade. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Enjoyed the little bit of different interaction with the different age kids. Um, and had a really wonderful time. I was appreciative of being able to uh, participate in that. Thank you. All right, thanks, Ms. Lyons. And at this point, I would like to, um, as I should have done it earlier, introduce our student rep. Sally Sott, who is the incoming DHS senior class president. And at this point, if you'd like to speak to the group about any fun activities that you have coming up at Dayton High School. Yeah, so we just hosted a prom at the high school, which went very well. I've been fundraising and planning since my freshman year, and I've only heard positives about it. We also had two of our CNA students play first and second at their nationals, and we'll be doing this today. And we also are going to be holding a blood drive with my talent and NHS National Honor Society May 3rd. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you for being here and welcome. All right, I'll uh, finish this off. It's been a last month has been very busy, um, both in school and uh, you know, working with some of the youth in our community, um, coaching some baseball. So we're not wanting to coach any baseball this year. Somehow I got roped into a couple different teams. So that's uh, been keeping me plenty busy. I actually got to ride a school bus for the first time in about 30 years uh, on Saturday. Uh, thankfully, only out to Fernley on Saturday. Um, I'd hate to go any further than that. I think those things are, you know, I was thinking about it afterwards. Those school buses are made for kindergartners up to high school. And I think they fit the kindergartners really well, but a little tough uh, for some bigger people. So. Um, I was a little sore um, after after that ride, so I'm just glad we went to Burnley. But that was it was fun. And then I also took another team out to Burnley a couple weeks before. So, and then my son had a little hunter safety thing on Wadsworth. So I was actually out in Burnley three times in the last week. So, got to check on the progress of the new uh, gym building out there in Burnley and see how Mayor McIntyre is running the city, doing a good job. So, um, with that, I. Close that, and we will move on to attitude of gratitude, Mr. Park. Thank you, Chris. Um, so this one is from Kennedy Smith at Dayton High School, um, and she's writing on behalf of Ms. Frank. I uh, hope I'm pronouncing that right. I want to thank her for always being optimistic and encouraging. Thank you for also understanding when things might not have gone the way we thought. I love how much you always make class so much fun and not boring like some other classes. Also, thank you for encouraging me in lifetime fitness. I didn't think I was gonna like it, but I am already excited for the next class. Love you and have an amazing day. Thank you. Uh, mine's written by Harvey. He goes to Burnley Elementary School. My name is Harvey and I am successful at Burnley Elementary School because of Mr. Korf making me feel appreciated at school and welcome. Hi, Ms. Parsons. My name is Isabella Pacheco, and I am successful at Sutro Elementary because of Mrs. Daw. 
I want to thank her for being a great teacher and showing us new games. She makes us make sure we're safe and something to others. Miss Dahl is always respectful, responsible, and safe. Miss Dahl is the greatest PE teacher in this school. All right, mine is from Sophia, who was successful at Riverview Elementary because of Miss Kisani. I want to thank her for making me feel safe because whenever someone needs help, like need somebody off the bus when they need to be picked up or have to be picked up, Ms. Kasani is also is very kind to others and her surroundings. Ms. Kasani also guides you through things when you are lost in the school or finding your classroom. Next slide. My name is Arlen and I'm successful at Sutro Elementary School because of Mrs. Sodenberg. I want to thank her for helping me read and be successful. When we read, she helps people sound out the word. She is super nice. Whenever we listen to her, we get to do fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Scott? My name is Logan Pratt, and I'm successful at Yankton High School because of Mr. Soto. I want to thank him for always being kind and saying hi to me almost every day. Mr. Walker? Mine says, my name is Noah, and I am successful at Sutro Elementary School because of Mrs. Burns, who I believe we have here tonight. I want to thank her, uh, excuse me, I want to thank Mrs. Burns for being nice to me. Mrs. Burns, thank you for helping me. Thank you for calming me down when I needed to. Thank you. All right, and my is uh, my name is Miss Childs, and I'm successful at Yarrington High School because of Miss Simon. I want to thank her for what I mean. She that you are encouraging and helpful to students and staff. Thank you for your support. All right, moving on to item number nine, superintendent report. Thank you, Mr. President. So just quickly, uh, welcome to Cali Stock. Glad to have you here. Thank you for giving us some time with your family and friends to be with us. I uh, also want to thank our staff here at Sutro for hosting us tonight, along with Chartwell. And then uh, just a reminder that April has been our Child Abuse Prevention Awareness Month, and we're very grateful for all those who have participated. There were some opportunities to uh, wear blue to show our support, also placing a pinwheel and some different activities. So thanks to everyone for doing that. And then finally, uh, tomorrow is Admin Assistance Day or Secretary's Day. And I just want to thank uh, Margaret Heim for being an incredible and amazing assistant to the board and also to myself. So thank you, Margaret. And that's all I have, Mr. President. All right, thank you, Mr. Workman. Uh, moving down to public participation, is there anybody that wishes at this point to come up and give some public participation? All right, let me read this. Uh, public is invited to address the board on items not listed on the agenda. The purpose of public comment is to bring issues, concerns, or praiseworthy items to the attention of the board. No action may be taken on any subject raised during public comment until the matter has been properly placed on the agenda for a properly noticed meeting to NRS 241. If you wish to speak, step up. To the front table, be seated and state your name. Your comments must be limited to no more than three minutes and must fall under subject within the board's jurisdiction and control. Questions to be submitted to the board clerk in writing in consideration of others, avoid repetition. Although the board does not restrict comments based upon viewpoint, comments will be prohibited. If the contents are willfully disrupted, slanderous, amounts to personal attacks, or interfere with the rights of other speakers, comments made during this time will be monitored by a board president. Greg Clark from Wellington. President Cooey and Superintendent Workman, it seems that Lyon County parents and citizens must resort to NRS 239 public record request for simple answers to simple questions. Let's take just one example. Lyon County School District Board of Trustee committee assignment said yes to be provided. The request was made at the January 24, 2023 Lyon County School District Board of Trustees meeting. President Cooey graciously offered to provide email for exchange. And I even provided a simple table to be filled in. No list has been provided to date, three months later. Why? 
thinking perhaps there was some grand secret regarding school board committee assignments, I attended other Nevada school board meetings to understand the secret. And guess what? I did not even have to ask the committee assignment. At the April 11, 2023 Douglas County School District Board of Trustees meeting, a simple table was available for Douglas County parents to sit, both hard copy and online, and attached to this public comment for your reference. So the Douglas School Board, the Douglas County School Board is not afraid to provide. Why are you? Again, this is just one example of a disappointing and troubling lack of transparency and accountability demonstrated by the Lyon County School District and its Board of Trustees. I look forward to answers to many outstanding questions, even if this school board thinks it's necessary to waste taxpayer dollars, parents and citizens to invoke NRS 239 for, again, simple answers to simple questions. Thank you. All right, anybody else during public participation? I'm pretty loud. <laughs> um, I'm a fifth grade teacher at Silver State Middle School, and I have been employed almost 20 years with the Lyon County School District. On December 21st of last year, I was physically assaulted by a student. It was 7.15 in the morning. The buses had not arrived, and around 25 students waited outside after the parents had dropped them off from school. I was getting out of my car and saw a former student chasing a boy. I didn't know. I told Michael to stop chasing him, and he told me, but Miss Fulton, he has my phone. I told the boy to quickly give it back to him, and he threw it away from Michael. I told him I was, I was walking to the sidewalk to come with me to the office. The boy was yelling and cussing at me. I bent down to pick up his backpack to get him to follow me to the office for the safety of the other kids. Besides, he was so angry. I kept walking and I heard him running behind me. I thought he either was running to catch up, to continue his verbal assault on me, or was about to grab his backpack as kids have done in the past before. Instead, he used his body as a battery ram at a full run into my lower back. I went to urgent care that day. And a couple of days later on Christmas, I was at the ER all day in horrific pain. My blood pressure was 263 over 212. I was on morphine. And my urine was dark red with giant blood clots. I was diagnosed with blunt force trauma to my kidney with hematosis, three disc herniations, an annular tear between two vertebrae, and I am radiating symptoms down my legs with paralysis and pain. Now I am unstable and may have suffered a permanent disability for the rest of my life as the documents I have shared with you this evening shows. Our security cameras were down in the front of the school, and I have not been and have not been working in the front for some time. At the time, we were also without a deputy between the three schools in Silver Spring. 
Deputy Van Diver talked to me days after the assault. I came this evening because I feel that you have a right to know what is really going on sometimes in our school. I never imagined this would have ever happened to me. Teachers did not sign up to be verbally, and physically harassed, threatened, and assaulted daily, weekly, or at any time. We are also supposed to, sorry, we are supposed to also be working in a safe learning environment to do our job at the best of our ability for our students. Um, I just had to come this evening and share this. awareness and knowledge of power and change I realized could happen. But we have to realize also that there is some problems going on. There's a colleague at school that I have known for years at the elementary school in Florida. So, Ms. Stratton, I hate to cut you off, but we are past. I know. I'm sorry. So, if you could just kind of wrap it up. And then... Just one, one last thing. Okay. He told me, this is Carmen, kids weren't born this way. Unfortunately, they're raised this way. And it is something I know that we are all feeling in our spirit. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Neil McIntyre, for the record. You know, I think a great solution to Mr. Clausen's uh, little problem, which I consider very small, would be to take uh, your committees on doing this at the city and the people that are on the different committees, put them on your website so people can go. Because I know a lot of times um, my council are on different committees and we're posting it on the website so that the chairs of these committees know who from the city is on that committee. So that, that might be something that'd be pretty easy for um, Erica to put on the website and move on what committee. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next. Good evening, board members. Um, my name is Candace Landa, and I'm the current varsity coach for Yarnton High School softball team. And I come to you for two reasons to bring some awareness to you guys. The first one is our softball field. It's not a safe um, practice playing condition. And then the next um, that we want to bring up to you guys' attention to is our goal to have a safe playing softball field for our program in the future. We're hoping that this can happen by next year um, in 2024. Um, with me is the thing coach Nate Landa. And I'm going to give him the time in a minute to talk more about the field and how it's deplorable and not safe for our athletes. Currently, um, the city of Urington has been very compatible with us. They have a youth program. It's Walk River Little League. I can be really just nervous. It's Walk River Little League, and they have 34 teams from juniors all the way to um, or lower to T ball, and they have four city fields. And so, the, I mean, imagine all of the teams needing to play off these four fields. It's, it's, it's amazingly um, that it works out, but um, to to get um, enough playing time and practice time on the field is it, pretty it's pretty rough. And so our softball field has been playing both for over 10 years. And the pictures that you guys I submitted to, you, to the board, it shows that it's been vandalized. Um, um, the batting cage is, is incredibly insane. It's not safe. So like I said, he'll get to that part of it um, more importantly. But I wanted to bring your attention to Title IX. And I'm not saying that the board is a violation of Title IX by no means. But there's a subsection in Title IX that I'm hoping will kind of help um, propel this on a fast manner. And it's specifically in section P and it's entitled specific provision number 65 federal regulation 52872.450B. 
And it says a number of factors are set forth to determine equality of opportunity, including but not limited to the provision of equipment. And it continues with scheduling of games, practice time, um, with more um, uh, variables in play. But it, it concludes with provision of training facilities. So our facility for Yankton High School for softball, there is no training facility at all. It's not playable. Um, we spent many years trying to get it playable, um, Coach and I, with uh, numerous other coaches, and we just can't get it playable. Um, but I've been um, employed as a varsity coach for the last two months, and so in the last two months with the school, I've been in conflict communication with the high school administration, um, trying to get maintenance on board too, so I could learn, you know, what facility resources they have that could help us with this goal but also coming to you guys to learn what I can and who I can work with on the board to help kind of propel this. Okay. Um, again, my name is Nate Landis. i um, been a coach for over 20 years at all levels, college, high school, Little League. Um, I've been involved in Walker River uh, in Yarrington for about 15 years. And um, in these 15 years, I've been on this too. Um, from the days of when I played in high school in Yarrington, this field has always been um, playable. Uh, it, it was always something that the high school program was proud of. It, it was something that um, the high school owned. Um, I don't know where it went. It, it's completely gone somewhere else. That field is no longer our high school field. It is, but it's not. And there's, there's no... Um, the potential is there. There is a lot of potential on this field. Um, we, we've attempted in many, many opportunities to end hours to try to improve this field. Um, the batting cage, just to describe it, is uh, unsafe. Uh, any coach, even a coach that is able to catch a ball from younger people will get hit <laughs> from all directions. It's just, um, it, it, uh, a coach that's never coached before, I wouldn't put in there because that's how unsafe it is. Um, kids uh, walk through the infield and there's a layer of go heads everywhere. Um, rocks, everything is risen from underneath the soil. Um, so it has to be dug up about four inches and new stuff needs to come in. Um, Again, I, I want to make sure you guys understand the potential is there. Um, it was always our home field, and we want to get it back to where that is. Um, and not having a home field and going out, out of town to other cities, um, they all have their home fields, and it's amazing. You could go to other fields, and they have the, the potential of having their own field, and we haven't had it. so. Um, I think that's kind of where we're at is we want something that's ours and uh, we want pride back on that field and you know um, I think everybody there the coaching staff and adults they're willing to put the time and effort so, thank you yeah thank you Mr. Landon it's been a it's always a pleasure coaching against you yeah. we've seen each other out on the field many a time so and I, and for me personally, I you know I was a little disappointed too to see that the girls softball field is in such disrepair there in Yarrington High School. It, it it doesn't make sense to me. So yeah, that would be something that we'll definitely uh, bring forward on a future agenda item. So all right, thank you. All right, anybody else under public participation? Uh, hi, my name is Charles Reyes. Um, I'm a student at UNR. Uh, currently, I'm taking an education class, uh, education in the or education in the changing world. And um, for my final, I am supposed to speak over a subject that um, uh, a social issue that I feel is important. So I decided to come up to you guys today to speak on the safety of students 
and propose the possibility of implementing clear backpacks or the implementation of students being required to use clear backpacks instead of the cloth backpacks. Um, the way I see it, it reduces the possibility of students bringing any sort of weapons on the school grounds. Um, currently, there are a lot of major sports stadiums and other venues uh, around the country that have implemented uh, this rule that only uh, clear, that the only large bags allowed in their venues are are clear plastic backpacks or duffel, uh, clear duffel bags. Uh, some of those include Greater Nevada Field, uh, Lawler Event Center, Mackey Stadium. Um, I know there's a bunch, uh, all the stadiums in California now require that. Um, along with that, there are other school districts across the country that have begun to require students to use those backpacks, especially after the uh, the recent shootings and the recent uh, Uvalde, the Uvalde shooting. Um, some of those districts include the San Antonio Independent School District, the Dallas Independent School District. There are also a couple of districts uh, in New York and in New Jersey that have also done this. Um, I know some people might think that uh, that it might cost more to get these backpacks instead of instead of the regular backpacks, but uh, upon doing the research, they cost the same as uh, regular cloth backpacks, uh, averaging between $10 and $40. Um, you know, parents and students can get them online. They can get them at Walmart. Uh, I think Big Five has them. Um, but overall, I feel that students will be will feel safer uh, if this would be implemented because uh, it reduces the chance of someone to bring any sort of weapon onto school campus and uh, school grounds. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Appreciate that. All right. Anybody else under public participation? Okay, seeing none, we'll close it at this time and we will have public participation at the end of the meeting too. If you, anybody so inclined to come up. All right, I'm on item number 11, the consent agenda. Um, uh, yes, Ms. Peterson. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Sorry, who's second? So I had a motion by Ms. Peterson, a second by Ms. Lines. Any further comments from the board or from the public on this item? All right, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, it passes 620. All right, item number 13, discussion of possible action to interview and appoint a board trustee to the vacant district seven position on the Lyon County School District Board of School Trustees. This item is being presented by myself and board clerk, uh, Ms. Peterson. So at this time, I think what we will do is we will open it up for our candidates to come forward. Uh, they have been given a list of questions. I'm going to go uh, basically from. I'm going to go from the way that they are listed here on the agenda. Uh, so we're going to start with Mr. Uh, James Whistler, I believe is how you say that, and then we'll move on to Miss Jennifer Garrett, and then fine, finally we'll have Mr. Neil McIntyre. While we are conducting those um, questions, uh, we we're going to ask the other two candidates to go with Mr. Logan to the office there so that they're not hearing uh, answers that the other candidates are giving. Yes, Mr. Hendricks. So I was studying the backup material for all, all three applicants and they all three have letters of intent, but only two submitted resumes. 
online and in the and is published uh, per NRS. It states, I quote, that applicants must submit the following, a current resume and a letter of intent, end quote. And only two of the applicants have done this. Okay. So I see only two qualified applicants. Yeah, yeah I mean, I believe that uh, one of those other applicants had a resume. I mean, we recently did this, I mean, about a year ago. So I mean, under with that, but it states that they must submit a resume. Okay, well, I'm Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Yeah. What's yeah. your legal well, opinion, I'm, Mr. Latin? Uh, I reviewed the materials before coming to the meeting, and I believe the one one of the ones that you're referring to uh, submitted a letter which outlined what I would consider to be resume material. So I think that letter would qualify both as a letter of intent and a resume. Uh, thereby making all three candidates uh, qualified uh, for, so, so for the BMB. So the fact that he only submitted a one-page letter of intent, you're qualifying as a resume. No, what I'm saying is that letter is more than a letter of intent. It contains information which could be classified as material you would see in a resume. Yeah, I would agree there. I mean, it gives yeah pretty decent history of I'm okay with both three candidates. Yeah, I'm okay too interviewing everybody. So it's, with that, we'll have uh, Mr. James uh, Whistler come up first. Mr. McIntyre and Ms. Jared, if you could follow Mr. Logan, his office there on the side. And I don't remember getting any tough form questions as well. Did that get emailed out or something? Needed some fresh air. <laughs> Good evening. All right. I am James Whistler. Now I'm nervous. <laughs> I've actually never done one of these, so uh, do I just start? Well, so, so what we will do is we will ask you uh, five questions. Okay. Um, and I'd just like to remind uh, the board members that if we ask, one applicant a question we have to ask that of all three and then once we get past the first applicant we can't ask questions that we didn't present to the other applicants to answer all right so question number one is please describe the role of a board trustee in the line county school district and the experience you have had interacting with this board all right uh i believe that the board is there to make decisions as a group for the benefits of the schools the students based on the common expectations and goals and needs of the community and the students and i have um the only interaction i've had is i've met with mr hendrick once before um i had some questions after this uh came out to ask him some stuff and i was able to get a hold of mr hendrick and talk to him about what the board does and stuff like that okay are there any follow-up or should we move on to question number two all right, question number two is please describe the experience and skills you possess that make you the most qualified candidate to fill the role of Lyon County School District District 7 School Board Trustee. So I've never been actively involved in uh, the schools before. Um, I was a military guy, did 23 years in the Navy. So I was always bouncing around between Virginia, Guam, San Diego, Washington, you name it, I was there. Um, the Opportunities I had during that time. Um, soccer coach for many years in many different communities. I uh, actually did some time as a teacher's assistant, and that was probably really cool because every time I walked in, the kids were always like, Captain Planet, you know, it was really cool to be able to walk in and hear these young children talk about that. Throughout this time, I was able to gain a really well 
a really well relationship with the community, the parents, and the students. And that has allowed me to understand different perspectives coming from each student or each parent, and sometimes the teachers, because I've had to talk to teachers as well when I was in there um, as the assistant, or even when my daughter was going to school when I was up in Washington where she was. Um, the military also provided me a opportunity to learn how to talk to people from pretty much all walks of life and to understand them. Um, even as a senior petty officer, I was able to, you could say, educate um, the, the kids that were coming in on our correct on our job and also to teach them the ability of college and watch some of them pick certain orders based on what they want to do with their career and say, okay, you want to finish school in the Navy, you're not going to get that on the boat because the internet is horrible on a ship. You want to go to these squadrons because they go to Air Force bases. And if you know anything about the military, the Air Force is the cush job, we'll say. So that was always the route that I, I would send depending on their career choice and path. And I'm sorry, I feel I can bring all of that talent and all of that here to District 7 and to Lyon County to interact with the wonderful folks here. Okay. All right, question number three, please describe how a board of trustees can collectively impact the education of students in a school district. I believe that as a board of trustee, um, kind of seeing my notes here, by creating the right conditions for excellence to flourish and setting high expectations of success. I also believe that board members, as long as they work together and believe that they have a positive effect on the student's outcome, we can accomplish, or the board can accomplish anything. Okay. All right, question number four, what do you believe are the biggest issues in the Lyon County School District and how will you address that? One of the ones that I've noticed, and this is um, one that I've also been able to see some positive, um, I can't even think of the word, some positive impact coming is, I think bullying is a big problem and that's not just here in Lyon County, that's all across the nation. I keep up with a lot of current events. Um, as a young child, I was bullied all the way through high school actually. So I understand what it's like for these kids. And I think, I understand that our last governor could have kind of tied the hands of the board of trustees and the district members and the teachers. And I really like what Sheriff Pope is doing with zero tolerance. I think it's a good way to start giving back to the community, but also holding people responsible at the same time. And that children will see that this is not the way of life you want to go down or the path you want to go down. Thank you. Um, question number five, please describe your experience with large scale budgets, policy and legislative advocacy. How will you use this experience to benefit the students of Lyon County? Uh, that one was kind of a tough one for me to honestly think of um, just because half my life has been spent in the military. The opportunities I had in that and uh, the job I do, I'm an aircraft mechanic by trade. Uh, we use a lot of equipment. Most of our aircraft is anywhere from 30 to 60 million dollars, 30 million to 60 million. Very expensive. The equipment we use can, you know, one tool can be 60, another tool could be a couple million. So in certain situations, I was in charge of all of that. So I had to know, okay, if I'm gonna get these items, we are on a budget. We had certain budgets throughout the military as well. And I had to know what I could afford and what I couldn't. Um, every year in October, we get a new budget. So sometimes it's like, oh, I gotta wait till this budget comes out before I can put in the paperwork to get all these items needed. And I believe dealing with that, because a lot of that could be high intensity, high stress of, hey, we need this part right now or this aircraft's not going anywhere and we have a mission. So a lot of that creates a high stress environment. And learning how to do all of that, find the parts, find the correct numbers for these parts, all of that, gave me the opportunity to learn how to kind of keep my cool in a high stress moment and do what I need to do, get it back to the superiors and say, hey, here's what we got, here's what we need to do and find out if we're gonna get it done. 
And in some instances it was, hey, I need three or four quotes before we can make a decision. And I had to run around and start getting quotes from different companies or different places, put all that together and then present it before my superior officers. Okay, thank you. All right, this time with answered those five questions. Uh, Mr. Farr, do you have any uh, questions that you would like to ask all three of the candidates that aren't listed here? Just one. Okay. Um, do you have any children or any other vested interest in the school district? I do have a daughter. She's 20 today. <laughs> Guess I better call her and tell her happy birthday. Or no, 20 tomorrow. I'm lucky. <laughs> um, she's in college right now, but I do have a girlfriend who has four students up in uh, one's going to Fermley High School, one is going to uh you know i'm going to forget the name middle school elementary and next year one will also be an elementary and so i do have a vested interest because i want them to have the best possible education that they can get and watch them progress and grow up and move on to become successful members of society thank you You're welcome, sir mr hendricks i'll pass Ms. parson yeah how important is you think test scores are uh, are you talking standardized tests, ma'am? Mm -hmm. I, I think they can be very important because it allows the students to look past in their to the past and see how they progress and to also see what areas they may have digressed. Um, I'm, I guess you could say while I was active duty, they weren't standardized, but for me to promote, I had to take a test every six months. When those tests were done, I was able to see, hey, these are the subjects you did really good on or, wow, you, you need to study a lot. And so I think that the standardized test can be very important to allow those students to take the test and then go back and say, hey, I did really good here, or this is where I need to improve. And then it gives them a good idea of where they might be headed in their future as well. All right, thank you. I don't have a question. I just have a statement, is that okay? Yeah. Um, I was in your seat once many years ago, so I know how nerve wracking it is. So thank you for coming today. You're welcome. And it's okay, you can be nervous. I understand. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, all right. So, I, and I'll ask this of all uh, three candidates as well. So, I just kind of want to know, like, what your history is uh, in Burnley. I mean, how long you've been there? Uh, so, I retired out of the military um, officially January of 2020, 2022. Okay. I moved to Burnley in November. I got a job down in Fallon at Pop Gun, working on helicopters there. So, I've been there since. Um, I've been able to kind of get out in the community and get to know people through my church and whatnot. Um, more, more recently, I was able to go with my future stepson, my uh, mom, to the Friendly High School. And they were there talking about the marching band with the teacher leaving and stuff like that. So I was able to go there and kind of give them ideas of how I think we could save the marching band because I thought that was very important for the kids to have. And so when I got here, I decided that, hey, you know, you bounced around your whole life. I was a military brat as well, so I was never in any place more than four or five years. And I, I told myself, you know, that hey, I tend to kind of complain about things. It's like, well, now's the time to actually put that to action and get out there and help make the change instead of sitting at home and kind of mumbling to yourself about what you think may be wrong or what you might do to fix it. So I said, hey, you know, get involved. And I saw this position open up. I thought, well, this is a good opportunity, especially with four young boys going into different schools. I really wanted to be able to one set of set the example for them, but to also set the example for my friends in the community that have children in the same situation. Okay. So you were saying, I mean, since about November twenty. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, November twenty two. Okay. Or twenty one. I'm sorry. Oh, November twenty one. Yeah, November twenty one. Okay. I was on terminal leave for about two and a half months. It's kind of nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the only reason I asked is because I mean there was a. I mean, there was a recent election. Um, yes, I did. That it. took place. Mm -hmm. I mean, for this board position. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, as far as who put in, who didn't put in, and, and you know, if you were in the community or not. So that's yeah. that. No, yeah, no. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. You too. Have a good evening. Uh, maybe that's a Uh, next is going to be Miss Gary. Oh, 
Hello and welcome. Thank you for uh, throwing your name in the hat and coming down tonight to uh, answer some questions for the board. With Thank that, you. if you would like to like make an opening statement or something, or if not, we'll just jump right into the question. Uh, my name is Jennifer Garrett. Uh, I'm a resident of Fernley in Lyon County, and I'm very proud to work with a number of youth uh, programs within our community. I've been doing that for almost 15 years. Thanks for your service to your community. So. All right, question number one, please describe the role of a board trustee in the Lyon County School District and the experience you've had interacting with this board. Um, I would say that the role of the board of trustees is to support uh, educational teams and facilitate the unique educational pathways for each student. I have interacted, I've attended a few meetings, um, primarily by Zoom during COVID, back at home, and I've um, kept up with agenda and minutes, but I am primarily involved within the school, volunteering and participating in the activities of the majority of schools in Vermont. All right. Question number two is please describe the experience and skills you possess that make you the most qualified candidate to fill the role of Lyon County School District as your seven school board trustees. I have, as I stated earlier, been actively involved with several different youth organizations within um, the community. But primarily, I would say that my greatest asset is being an advocate, a fierce advocate of vulnerable populations. I've just spent the last four years um, working on my doctoral degree, studying um, rural communities and the unique characteristics of them. Okay. Uh, question number three, please describe how a board of trustees can collectively impact the education of students in a school district. A board of trustees can collectively affect and the education of students within it by being actively engaged in the community, by participating in schools, as many of you have shared your activities within our schools, and by being a support for the staff and um, students and families within the community. Thank you. Question number four, what do you believe are the biggest issues in the Lyon County School District and how will you address them? I believe that the greatest challenge facing Lyon County at this point in time is truly the great growth that we're seeing community-wide, county-wide. And I think that preparing the infrastructure of our schools to adjust to that growth and change is important. And um, maintaining that or, or being involved with that process can take a lot of different forms, but I think actively engaging within that, uh, within the different conversations that are taking place as we grow is imperative for the school district. Well, thank you. Question number five is please describe your experience with large scale budget policy and legislative advocacy. How will you use this experience to benefit the students of Lyon County School District? As a member of the organizations that I work with, I participate in the budgeting process. Um, as area director of AYSO, I hope 13 different um, regions facilitate their budgeting process. Um, and then as the largest 501c3, there is a lot of transparency and growth or dialogue that takes place regarding the budgeting process. So I sit in on a lot of budgeting meetings. I don't necessarily have a lot of input because I don't spend that much money, but I um, listen and I uh, participate and shut down when necessary or allow when necessary. So that's kind of the role that I play. Okay. Thank you. So that concludes our questions. Now, uh, two trustees are going to have another question to ask you. So, Mr. Carr, if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, yes. Thanks for being here, by the way. Um, do you have any children or other best interests in Lyon County? I have two children currently in Lyon County. I have one. That graduated last year, another one set to graduate this year with my seven first. Okay. Ms. Parson. Okay. okay. Um, I just want to know your feelings on test scores, like math and 
as fast, mm -hmm. all of those. Test, test scores are one facet of a student. So I think it's imperative that we look at, we, we address student issues holistically. We can't look at one component um, simply as the be all end all, but I, test scores do play an important role in evaluating how we're performing. It's not one piece, it's just one piece of the pie, but I think it is important to make sure that we're, um, we're looking at our test scores and figuring out how we can, first of all, making sure we're compliant with, um, with regulations regarding tests, but I think it's important also to make sure that we're keeping an eye on them. Thank you. Oh, I just made a comment, not a question, but um, thank you for coming. I know how nervous you are because I had to do this myself, and it's very strange process. So thanks for coming. All right, and the question that I've asked uh, the previous applicant, I'll ask you as well, is if you could just kind of give me your history and for me how long you've been there. And In a few days, I will have lived in Fernley for about 19 years. Um, my children have lived in Fernley their entire life. Um, when we moved there, I was teaching for the Washoe County School District, and my husband was working in Lovelock, so we both commuted and, it, commuted, and it was a perfect place for us to start off our lives together there. Um, and uh, he still goes to Lovelock, and I am a home health nurse, so I go all over the county. Okay. And for Hill County. All right. Well, thank you. I think that concludes uh, our line of questioning. So at this point, we'll have you step out. Mr. McIntyre, step in. Thank, thank you. you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Feels like uh, we just done this recently. So thanks for being here again tonight. Um, of course. So I've let the other applicants tell me if they want to give a statement or we can just go straight into the question. If that works. Well, you guys all know me pretty well. So I think we just get right after the questions. And unless there's anything anybody doesn't know about me yet. <laughs> All right, question number one is please describe the role of a board trustee in the Lyon County School District and the experience you have had interacting with this board. Uh, so the job of the board is basically to kind of set the policies and, and standards that the kids um, attending the school system have to adhere by and they make adjustments as, as needed. Um, they also work with budgeting and money and trying to allocate where the money is going to be spent within the district. Um, for different projects, um, programs that the kids might be um, needing for their education. Um, I've been involved with this board for a very long time. Uh, my dad obviously sat on this board for 14 years, and I've watched all the progress and, and stuff that you guys have made on this board and the improvements that you guys have made, and I've, I've always wanted to be part of that, um, watching him. And I have, you know, kids in the school system, so... I just wanted to be part of the solution and not be one of those parents part of the problem. Thank you. All right, question number two is please describe the experience and skills you possess that make you the most qualified candidate to fill the role of Lyon County School District, District 7 School Board trustee. Well, I'd like to say that I've hit every aspect of the school district um, in all different areas. I do have a special needs daughter, so I've worked at the parasite. Um, I've had uh, school teachers in the family, got administrators that have kind of worked with the school district. Um, you know, and I've worked with these kids. I, I coached the high school wrestling team, so I've been involved in that way. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of different aspects of the school system. My kids have went through four or five different schools in the Fermi area, you know, and I went through those schools, K through 12, 
and I've, I've seen the changes in things that have happened at these schools and I, and I, I realize there's problems that need to be addressed and I really would like to be a part of that and have a voice in it. I'd like to be a voice for not only the kids, but the teachers and the parents. All right, thank you. Uh, question number three, please describe how a board of trustee can collectively impact the education of students in a school district. Well, obviously the board is made up of multiple people. It's not one person that's gonna change the policy. It's not one person that's gonna make a difference, but together one individual talking with another one and coming together as a group and, and coming up with a consensus on a vote is very important. One person should not set all the standards and rules for the kids in their education. It takes a lot of different people from different areas of their um, businesses or their background. You know, I come from a construction background, so all the buildings that, that we pay the money to have built and maintained, got a pretty good idea on how that works. Um, at work, I work with budgeting, um, and I've worked with the union, and I know the, you know the teachers are part of the union, and I'm a union member. I always have been, and so I, I'd like to deal with that. I know how to deal with it. Right now, I'm in negotiations for contracts with my company, and so I'm in that process. So I have a lot of uh, background in that kind of thing. Thank you. Uh, what do you believe are the biggest issues in the Lyon County School District, and how will you address them? Well, I think the biggest issue right now is probably the violence that we're seeing in our schools. And I know we have the policies there, um, and it's hard for the enforcing of those policies because a lot of the power has been taken out of the people that are there to actually enforce the disciplinary actions um, that are necessary. I love seeing that the Lyon County Sheriff are getting involved with that now. I think that is a great thing. I'm not sure how that came about. Uh, Sheriff Brad Pope came up with that, or if the school board actually reached out, collaborated with the Sheriff's Office. But I think that's a great idea. Um, I mean, just personally, last week, you know, every kid has me. Um, my daughter was getting off the school bus, and kids that she rides with every day. And just for some reason, one kid decided to bully her last week. And she came home crying, and she is my special niece. Um, and she wouldn't tell me about it. And I'm like, why? Why won't you tell me what's going on? Well, nobody's going to do anything anyway. That killed me. I'm like, I'm your dad. I will do something about this if I can. I'm like, but don't be afraid. And she goes, I'm not afraid to ride the bus. I just didn't like the house. So, you know, I want to be involved. I think that's one of our biggest things right now. Our education programs right now, I think, is great. We got that jump start that has been excellent for these kids, getting them college oriented. I mean, there's a lot of good things going on in the Lyon County School District that I'm proud of. But I think our biggest problem right now is trying to control the violence that we're seeing there. Thank you. All right, question number five is please describe your experience with large scale budget policy and legislative advocacy and how will you use this experience to benefit the students of Lyon County School District? I think you touched on a few. We've touched on a few of those things, and um, another great asset that I have is that my wife really is teaching, and so she deals with budgets all the time, and um, I'm always having to work with her. My own household come up with budgets. <laughs> she doesn't like mine, um, but I, I deal with the budget skills I work too, so I'm an, I'm an instructor for construction, um, construction in Reno with the Tri-State of Water Authority, and I work special projects. So we're doing main replacements, we're doing this, and I have to work hand in hand with the contractor. And we have to make sure that we're staying in the budget. We have to make sure that if we go outside, you know, any extras and stuff like that. And then I have to come together with the accounting people and I have to go over all the numbers to make sure that everything's matching up and, and stuff like that. And so even though I'm in construction and I'm only an inspector, I'm very involved with the budgeting that goes on with my individual job on, on the site. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. At this point, that concludes our questions, but we do have a few board uh, members that have asked questions of the other applicants, so I'll have them ask you as well. So, uh, Mr. Farr, if you could ask your question. Yeah, you kind of answered some of these already, Mr. McIntyre, but uh, the question I have is, do you have any children or other best interest in Lyon County School? I do. Um, I had one that graduated last year from Fernley High School. Um, I currently have a seventh grader at Silverland Middle School, and I have a fifth grader at FIS. No more. 
but I do have numerous nieces and nephews in all these school districts as well. I have I have 19 nieces and nephews. Wow, thank you. No question. No question. Um, you have heard my question before. Um, how important are test scores? Test scores are important. I don't think it's necessary, the, the absolute gauge on how a kid is doing in education, looking at it from different aspects. When you have a kid that's in, in general education, yeah, test scores are probably a little bit more important to them, but I have special needs kids too, and their grades aren't as important as how they're progressing in the skills that they're learning. Are they learning? Are they still getting there? But I don't think that the grades are an, an end all for gauging a student. I mean, there's multiple ways that kids learn. You've got the visual learners, you've got um, people that are hands-on and they don't test well. There are certain kids that they just don't test well. And I don't think you can put a blanket over the whole situation saying that these are your grades, this is the kind of kid you are. Because I see kids that struggle in school that are smart and are gonna be beneficial to our community. And I think with the school, their grades aren't gonna show that, but their work ethic will. All right, thank you. And Ms. Peterson, you want to? Yeah, I just that? made a statement saying I've been in your seat trying to do this interview in public, and it's a strange thing. So thank you for coming. I'm not as nervous as I was the last time. <laughs> All right, and, and then my question to you, Ms. Mark, that I've asked the other uh, members is I just kind of want to know uh, your history in Fernley, how long you've been there. Born and raised, I have to think about my age all the time, but my kids can always tell me how old I am. Um, basically, 45 years I've been in Fernley. My parents were grew up in Fernley. My mom was born and raised. Uh, I've had grandparents. I think our family's been in the Fernley area since like 1940, yeah, like 41 or 42. Um, my dad, all the way through, you know, graduation. My my mom was before kindergarten, was first grade through. 12th grade, you know, my grandmother, you know, graduated. I think you guys were in the same class, um, graduated from Fermi High School. So we've had somebody in the Fermi school system since the 40s, and that's probably why I care about Fermi and the education system so much. All right. Thank you, Ms. McIntyre. So that concludes uh, the interview portion of this. So I think at this point we'll bring all the applicants back in and we'll have a discussion. So thank right. you. Thanks for your time and consideration. Maybe I'll we'll take a five minute break right now.
All right, thank you. So once again, I just wanted to thank the uh, three applicants uh, for taking the time tonight to, for one, submitting your information to this board and for two, coming out and interviewing with us. I know it's not an easy process and um, grateful that we had three people that were willing to uh, throw their name in the hat to see you know, who wants to serve uh, District 7. So at this point, we've heard from three applicants. And what I'd like to do now is go around and ask each individual board member um, to kind of give their thoughts on the three applicants. And we'll go forward at that. So Mr. Farr, if you would like to start. Uh, thank you very much. I, first of all, I'd like to thank all three of you for coming and putting your name in the hat. I know it's a big responsibility. Uh, we all do this and we take it very seriously. Um, so my, my takeaways from the interview questions were uh, specifically with Mr. Whistler, I want to thank you for your service. Number one, I too served a long career in the military, so I get where you're coming from on that. Uh, Ms. Garrett, I appreciate you for bringing your expertise to bear, with, especially when it comes to nursing and, and the medical field. And then uh, Mr. McIntyre, obviously, uh, I don't think anybody on this board has longer uh, district vested than, than, than you do as far as uh, living in the community and knowing and going through the school systems yourself. So thank you all for your comments. Um, I, I would say that my biggest takeaways, for me, some of the biggest answers and responses we got had to do with budgeting policy and, you know, um, what impact the actual school board provides. Um, in my thoughts, I was waiting to hear an answer that had to deal with financial stewardship of taxpayer money. That had to do with curriculum and standards um, and had to do with what I feel personally is the biggest issue facing Lyon County. It's the reason I ran, which has to do with we have an aging and crumbling infrastructure in this county that needs to be addressed first and foremost. So thank you again for your comments and your replies to the questions. And that's all I have. All right. Thank you, Mr. Farr. Uh, Mr. Hendricks. Yes, I'd like to thank you all for coming down here and going through the process. I know it it takes a lot to step up and present yourself in front of a board like this. I wanted to thank Mr. Whistler for his service in the military. That's a, a big service to our country, and I thank you for that. Also, uh, your commitment to the community and the service you've done for with youth sports and Boy Scouts and some of the other organizations. Ms. Garrett, I'd like to thank you for all the community service you do now and have done in the past. Your 20 years in the community and for being dedicated to improving your community. And Mr. McIntyre, I'd like to thank you for all your service and I know you ran during the election, and I like a lot of the things you said then as well. And it's good to see you here again. Thank you, Ms. Parson. Uh, yeah, I just uh, want to thank you guys for um, coming out tonight and putting yourself out there. And I wish the audience could see some of these resumes. We should have them copied so that uh, so that everybody could see them. Because I think that uh, the letters of intent and the resumes say a lot. So, anyway, that's what I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Yeah, hi. Thanks for coming out. I know I already said I've sat in your seat before, and it's very strange to do that. So it's uncomfortable. So thank you for being willing to step outside of your comfort zone. Um, I also really liked a lot of comments that all of you made, and I um, appreciated that um, the holistic view of the child is not just about a test score. And that's really important to me that we look at the whole child. And um, just, just the knowledge that the school board is a, a team and we have to work together is not just one person. And, and when you are functioning well, you work together well and, it, and you can move the needle forward in the district. And so I appreciate those comments. Thank you. 
I missed the line. Um, just wanted to kind of echo the same thing. Thank you so much for coming out, for being part of this process, for being willing to step up, um, for being involved with your community. That's so important. Um, and being willing to step up. This is not an easy job. It's a time commitment. It's, it's, it's a weighty job. And being willing to step up to the plate and, and like you said, be that parent. Be that parent that's willing to be involved and maybe make some hard decisions. Um, and I just want to say that each, all three of you made some really good, great points and make my job a lot harder. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Lyons. And uh, for my comment, I'll just, you know, I kind of go back to the question that I asked and kind of what the history that uh, individuals, you know, different individuals that applied kind of had uh, within the Fernley area. And I think that that, when I look at this, I, I think that that's, very important you know i want to see somebody um in this position that hopefully is going to be here for the next two years and have the motivation and willingness uh to give it their all to the students in Lyon county and you know when i i liked everybody's answers i thought they were um great uh, but for me it really comes down to the fact that um you know we we just recently had an election where we had uh, some candidates that uh, put their name in the hat for that election and and that's just going to kind of sway you know the way that I'm thinking as far as you know I know that one person you know that we interviewed tonight has been very active uh, within our board meetings has shown up to a lot of them it's not going to you know be a huge uh, change you know as far as bringing somebody up to speed on what some of the topics that we've been discussing so that's kind of where you know where I'm leaning um, but I do want to just you know tell everybody that i appreciate you you know throwing in your name so with that i will be looking for a motion mr president yes mr peterson i would like to nominate mr mcintyre second all right so we have a motion and a second to nominate uh, mr mcintyre any other board comments all right seeing none all those in favor signify oh we have a nomination and a second already on the floor. Ms. Feline. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Nay. All right, so it passes four to two. So congratulations, Mr. McIntyre. All right, at this point, uh, we'll, you know, we'll have you come up, Mr. McIntyre, we'll have you come up and sit at the, I need to give you your oath of office. Or did, do I give it to Yeah. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. At this point, I would like to turn some time uh, back over to Mr. Workman to introduce some people that we failed to introduce earlier. So now that we have a full board. Thank you, uh, President Cooey. And, and uh, this is a, a quick opportunity for us to introduce some people who were approved during the consent agenda uh, in, into some new positions. Um, and so if uh, Rachel Stewart will come forward and also, Mr. Damon Etter, and then, yeah, we'll we'll have you shake their hands in just a minute. 
and then uh, Miss Caitlin Castaneda as well. So uh, this happened a, a couple of meetings ago, but uh, uh, Rachel has been appointed as our new special services director, executive director for the school district. And uh, with her vacated position, Mr. Damon Etter, uh, it will now fill uh, her position as the data manager and PD manager for the school district. And then uh, Ms. Caitlin Denford uh, was approved tonight by you to fill the assistant principal spot over at Riverview Elementary. And so we just wanted to introduce them to you and give them a chance to get their hands. Thank you. All right, so we're just waiting uh, to kind of update the computer here a little bit. So I just wanted to congratulate uh, Ms. Castaneda. She's actually my second graders teacher this year. So anybody that can put up with her is, uh, my second grader has a lot of energy. I'm, we definitely should have probably had her first instead of last, but uh, she keeps us all on our toes. I'm sure she does thank Ms. Castaneda. So. Good. All right. Good. All right. Item number 14 for possible action discussion and possible action regarding a partnership with Carisolis Mental Health Care Coordination Service and the LCSD. This item is being presented by Deputy Superintendent Tim Logan and Executive Director of Student Services, Heather Moore. Good evening. We're excited to share this um, great opportunity for our students, staff, and families of Lyon County School District. Um, by partnering with Sarah Solis, we have an opportunity to streamline the process of coordinating mental health services for our students, families, and staff. Um, we could do this in two ways at the site level um, through the warm handoff referral process. Um, that is, in that case, we would have our, our families working in conjunction with the school personnel, and they would go through the, the referral process at school, and then we follow up on it there. Um, our parents, um, students, and staff also have the opportunity to access these services 24-7 in the privacy of their own home or whenever they need these services. Next I, so, so this is not a uh, counseling service. This is this is literally a kind of go-between. Um, literally, there's 60 plus phone calls that happen. They say for somebody that needs care to be able to get care, um, especially with the uh, counseling and psychologists and all that. There's there's a lack thereof. So this will have the ability to do a lot of um, uh, web uh, counseling. Um, there's a lot of providers there, plus it also outlines the providers that are in our area within 25 miles, 50 miles, and that allows parents to, to do that. Again, this warm handoff is, is literally to help take the individual and do a lot of the footwork for them to get them hooked up with providers. And again, the substance abuse is another one um, that, that's done through this as well. Um, maybe questions? So, Ms. Parsons, do you have a question? Um, no, I just have a comment. I just think that it, you said it's just thirty six thousand or something like that. It's thirty six thousand a year, um, and we're the the intention is. And thanks for bringing that up. The intention is use title funding, which is a very appropriate use of that title fund. Um, each school gets a certain amount of title funds each year, so roughly it's going to be about two thousand per school. Um, so in in that sense, it's a small amount of money to be able to take that work off our counselors and give that that ability for staff and uh, kids and parents to be able to access that. So yes, to answer your question, 36,000 a year, yes. So I just think that that's just not, you know, if they can save one child by getting through, sounds like it's 
the phone calls that told me the psychologist in that back from getting the help that the kids need. So if it helps one kid, it's worth it. I think Ms. Carson, uh, Ms. Lyon, then we have a question for Henry. Um, yeah, I just had a question about the um, the actual feasibility of it, like what, how it really works. So the majority of the youth or how does this place to get? Is this like um, coming from a family and just affirming that the parents are involved? If you could give us a little more information about that. Typically, um, within our MCSS process at our schools, parents work in conjunction with our school staff. And an example would be um, a student who's working with our counselor and our safe school professional. Um, they are working in conjunction with the parents trying to access these mental health services. It takes an average of six hours per child to coordinate this that initial visit. And so this would free up our school staff to be able to still work with kids instead of following up with those phone calls and coordinating those services, as well as, <clears throat> as parents too, providing that support. So basically, it, um, it's a proprietary software that can access all of the providers within, you can put in a 50 mile distance, 100 mile distance, and it will pull up all those providers that you can access right away. But the fact is the majority of this is, is parents are well involved with this process. Okay, thank you. And there are three ways to access it. One is through kind of the school system, um, but it still takes parent approval really to get that. Um, the second is web-based. They could go on, they can uh, select and, and kind of be more an, uh, anonymous as a family, what they're doing. Um, and the last way really is through telephone. Um, the, if, if you're going through the school system, it, the good part is right now, if, if we refer a parent saying, listen, there's there's a lot of concerns here, there's violence tendencies, whatever it might be, council has been trying to work with them, but we need further support. Um, we refer a parent, we really never know the outcome. Um, we don't even know if they ever really meet up with uh, a care specialist. So this way, once we have that, that parent says, yeah, I'm interested, we can get on and, and make that match. Then we're able to track it through the software system, not, not what counseling is actually occurring, but that there is a match that's made, visits that are occurring, and if there's a closure or whatever. So right now, and I, unable to track it and unsure if they're really getting matched up. But those are kind of three ways to get that support. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Peterson. Yeah, I think um, I've heard other districts have had success with this program, I believe. Um, I briefly heard of that, but I also just wanted to point out in the memo that I really appreciate that the principals and your assistant principals and counselors have been introduced to it and they see it as a benefit as well. So that was just a comment. And, and it really was uh, well accepted. Um, there's a lot of time that already goes into trying to match, match those providers. And I did uh, fail to mention when you talked about money, we are going for a grant as well. And that was in the memo um, to try to uh, subsidize this really through a grant. Um, but either way, it's, it's either through title or through a grant. Great. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hendricks. I just have a comment. I think that unfortunately, it, this is necessary. In today's world, we have increasing mental health and substance abuse problems. And this is a good way to see that everybody gets the best opportunity for care. Mr. Park, I guess my question would be a little more drilled down, Mr. Logan. Um, reading through this memorandum here, where you address the service to be provided for LCDFC students, families, and staff, I understand with HIPAA and the transportability, the portability of information, record sharing, that kind of thing are on the same page. My main focus would be on if staff members approach this, how confident it was in their information. We don't know if, if, again, there's multiple ways to approach this. If they came to the school and said, hey, I, I'm wanting help, can you help me get a provider? Then they may be in that system. But the reality is they're probably going to do it through web-based. Um, there is no way for us to track it necessarily at that point. Um, they could say in, as anonymous as they want, where we wouldn't even know they were acting. acting. So every aspect says it's kids, families, whatever. Co correct. Yep. Okay. Even, even at a kid level, we, we may not know that somebody has actually accessed it if they did it through the web and through their own process. Again, if you do it through the school, 
and I come to you as a, a counselor saying I need help, that kind of goes in the system to where we're able to track it. If I, if I can clarify, there will only be very limited people that have access to that information in the first place. We have to designate an administrator and a counselor and or a social worker at each school. So it's, it's exactly. not like infinite, yeah, it's not like infinite campus where um, all the teachers have access or, or anything that way. Okay. It, it is very limited and, and no help information is shared over this platform at all. This is 100% about uh, where they are in the process of getting access to the mental health provider. Okay. Right. Thank you. I have one follow up question. Are students going to be able to get this assistance without the knowledge of their parents? Through the, um, through, the, through the school referral process, no. They would have to have parent consent to access through the a referral process. Now, by state law, if they are above the age of 12, they can access this portal that they got on there. And then they, I, I'm sure they would reach out to their parents as well, but they can seek the, the services and assistance that they chose to. And I, and I would make the point that that's currently the law right now. Um, that, that is not changing. The age of 12, they can seek their own if, if they want it. So it's a hard thing to navigate by yourself. So uh, they would obviously try to involve the parents. It may I clarify? So just again, a student right now could pick up the phone. They could do a web search. If they're 12 years or older, they could legally do that and try and access care without parent permission, regardless of this platform. So this platform simply compiles that information in one place where they can access it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, this just makes it easier for them. All right. Thanks, thanks for that uh, presentation. I I think that, that, like you said, I think that that's a great use of title money. I know, you know, with the, a lot of students coming out of the pandemic, there's definitely a lot of mental health need out there. So however we can provide the resources to our students in a efficient way, I think is, is great. So thanks for bringing the forth. Yes. I'd like to make a motion that we um, form a partnership with Carousel of Mental Health Care Coordination Service. I second that. I second. All right, thank you. Um, so we have a motion by Ms. Parsons and a second by Ms. Peterson. Do we have any public comment on this item? Rick Lawson, I just wanted to thank Trustee Hendricks for making it clear on the record that the Lyon County School District is making it easier to separate the parent from the child. Is that the point you were trying to make there, Mr. Hendricks? Or? No, I just noticed that from the comments that were made that a student at age 12 or above can access health care, and this is obviously being put in place, make that easier. So, in fact, that is what it's going to do. I would counter that argument by saying that the ability for a child at the age of 12 or older has already been determined by the state. Yeah. We're just following state doctrine, so I don't know how that actually applies. And that makes no sense. How what applies? Well, what, what point are you making, Mr. Barr? What point are you trying to make? I'm saying that the cost argument for that we were making it easier for children to separate themselves from parents. That's not exactly what we're doing at all. The state made that requirement when they were made the age limit at 12 years of age. I could refer to Mr. Latin for clarification, but we're just following what the state puts into law, correct? That is accurate. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Barr. All right, any further uh, forward comment on this? All right, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I didn't know if I was okay. Oh, yeah, yeah no, you're good. All right, passes seven zero.
item number 15, discussion and possible action regarding public comment via email. This item is being presented by myself and board member, Mr. Hendricks. So at this point, uh, Mr. Hendricks, I'll turn some time over to you. Okay. Uh, so back in February, uh, President Cooey, Clerk Peterson, and Attorney Latin apparently made a decision um, outside of the board to allow public comment. And that was conveyed to me through an email from Mr. Workman. I felt like that was a decision that needed to be made by the entire board. So I emailed Mr. Cooey and I stated that, and his response was that uh, they'd always allowed public comment, and he was just clarifying that. Yet, in past meetings, it's been asked over and over again if they would allow public comment via email, and it's been denied. In those meetings, as well as Mr. Latin writing opinions to constituents in the county stating that public comment via email is not allowed. And the administration supporting that as well in written documents. So it hasn't been the policy of the district until two board members and the attorney decided change that. Now, as board members, we have no authority outside of open meeting. So you cannot unilaterally decide on a policy change without having the full board weigh in. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hendricks. Uh, Ms. Peterson? Yeah, just a point of clarification. So taking public comment via email during board meetings is different than having them submitted on the website the day before the meeting. And just to clarify, um, in March of 2020, when the governor shut down everything, um, we didn't have a meeting that month. But the next month in April of 2020, uh, Mr. McIntyre was the board president, and that's when we had our first virtual meeting. And that's when public comment was allowed to come in during the meeting via email. Nobody voted on that. It just happened because the president has control over public comment. Then in April of 2021, when Governor Sisolak announced local control, um, we had a different board president in July. And then in May of 2021, we closed the email during the board meeting for public comment. There was no vote taken on it. It just happened because, once again, the president monitored public comment. Then President Cooey decided he wanted to open up the email for public comment on, on the website. Um, by noon on Monday before the board meeting to allow people to make comments via email if they were going to miss the meeting. And of course, as clerk, I was asked about it because I might have had to post this or do something with it. Well, see, precedence has been set the whole time I'm on the board. I didn't see a problem with it because it just happened over and over and over with no problem. So, of course, I don't see it as a problem. I just want to state that. Uh, I think, thank you, Ms. Peterson. Uh, Mr. Latin. Uh, yes, I would uh, just like to indicate a couple of things. First of all, I don't make decisions for the board. I get uh, I give legal advice as to whether things are legal or whether there's something to be wary of. Uh, I would point all of the board members to policy number B E D. It's already in policy that public comment be in open meetings. And I would like to refer to a section that says public participation in board meetings. And what it says is all board meetings, with the exceptions of closed sessions, and all board meeting is identified as a public meeting, will be open to the public. The board invites district citizens to attend board meetings, again, open board meetings, become acquainted with the program, and operation of the district. This is the key section. Members of the public also are encouraged to share their ideas and opinions with the board. Then if you go down a little bit further in that same policy, which has already been adopted, 
by the board. There was no change in policy. It says procedures for participation in meetings during an open session of a board meeting. Members of the public are specifically invited to present concerns during the public comment portion of the agenda. Public speakers will identify themselves for inclusion in the minutes. Mm -hmm. So there has not been a change in policy. It's already in the policy and uh, the uh, chair was just follow, following policy and indicating how it would be going forward. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Latin, in your letter dated October 12, 2022, the second paragraph, you state, and I'm quoting, the first subject you raised in regard to a member of the public being able to submit written records by mail. As I explained in my August 25th, 2022 correspondence with Mr. Clausen, and now reiterate to you, written comment can only be submitted to a public board during the pandemic when the public board was following a Zoom board meeting. The Lyon County School Board of Trustees discontinued Zoom meetings and now holds its meetings in person and not by Zoom or any other electronic means. Persons wishing to make public comment can appear in person, read their comments into the record and submit their comments in person and writing. Mr. Hendrick, um, real quick point of clarification. What are you reading from, please? A letter from Mr. Latin's law firm um, to, to Greg Lawson's attorney, Mr. Fulton, stated, I can submit it into the record if you'd like. And also, I'd like to state that the district itself um, stated that the general public submits a copy of paired written remarks to be included in the meeting minutes. Um, Ms. Heim further informed the client that it, he would have to read it at the meeting and it would not be accepted via email. So it's been clearly stated by the attorney, by the district, that you do not allow public participation by email. And now you're telling me that this is just a clarification. It, it seems clear that you, do, you did not allow it. And now you've made a change without the approval of the board. I said that all along. That's like if you guys decide you want to do something, you just go ahead and do it. And then you say, oh, well, um, we're sorry that it's in the minutes, I mean, in the board, board book that we can't do it, but we're going to go ahead and do it anyway. Like the buses in Fernley, which says only residential. Hart, off I think topic. We're, yeah, we're off the topic. No, it's not the topic. It, it is off the topic. Okay, Ms. Parsons, I think you're confusing things when you're saying you guys. I think, I mean, Ms. Parsons, I mean, I think we're talking about the president of this board. So when we're talking about Ms. Lyons and myself as the president of this board, those decisions have been made. I mean, if you were the president of the board, I mean, you could decide um, how to how to set out the agenda. Okay. Ms. Parsons. Okay. So my uh, my thought was is that I wanted to have try to get more public comment, not less public comment. That if somebody couldn't come to the board meeting, I would was hoping uh, that they would submit comments uh, through the email. As we've seen um, over the last, I think, three months, we have not really received any email. So if it's the pleasure of the board, I'm more than happy to take the email section off of. Uh, the public comment so that people need to show up in person and make their public comments to the body. And, and then maybe we should put it on the agenda for next month that we will set it up the way we want it done. That's not what, the way somebody else wants it done. That's what we're doing, right? 
And as far as I believe that this agenda item is set up for that. So, um, so it says discussion and possible action regarding public comment via email. So I'm, I, I, I make a motion that we accept public comment via email and make a public make a board policy supporting that or or add it to an existing policy uh, BDD. Can I make a clarification, Ms. Mayor? Yes, yes, go ahead. You're stating about submitting board comment via email on the website, correct, before the meeting. That's what this is about. That there was email opportunities on the website that closed Monday at noon for people to submit comments about the agenda that's on Tuesday. So you want to put on the, your motion is to allow that to happen, to have that posted on the website, correct? I make a motion that we amend policy BDD and public participation board meetings procedures for public participation in meetings that after the second pair paragraph, a third paragraph is inserted to state, quote, public comment may be accepted via email and included in the back of material available to the trustees and the public prior to the meeting. The deadline to be included in the back of material is noon, the Monday before the meeting. That's my motion. So point of clarification, is that okay? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, please. You're stating that you want public to be able to email and participate during the actual open court, correct? Negative. The deadline for including, be included in the backup material. So on, so on the website, Monday before by noon, that's what you're clarifying. Yeah, the Monday, the same, the same timeline we have for Google Docs. So I thought it would be good to coordinate those two. Just make a motion that we keep doing it. Yes, I, I think it's a good policy. I, I just want it in our policy. I, I think to be able to arbitrarily decide when we can accept public comment via email and when we can't without having a full board vote on it is incorrect and violates open meeting law. So I'm just asking that we clean this up. That's all I'm doing. I support the public being able to comment via email. Um, Can that make a clarification? Okay, so we are not violating open meeting law at all. As a matter of fact, our board is exceeds open meeting law requirements. Current open meeting law says that you have to have public comment either before and after the meeting or before each agenda item, and you don't need to do both. So currently we go way above and beyond, and we are not, for point of clarification, violating any open meeting law requirements. Um, but there was deliberation by you, by you two, and the attorney to make this decision. Okay, so I think I mean a point of clarification is the fact that we're talking about a policy change now, and that's going to require two readings. So I mean, if we if we're willing, I mean, if we're ready to change BDD, um, I guess that can be um, you know we can bring that up for discussion at the next agenda or our next board meeting, if that's the way you guys want to go. I, I thought that's what we were doing here. That's why we had the agenda item. Well, I think, well, this is discussion and possible action. So, I mean, obviously the action that I took was to allow uh, further public comments since I set the agenda. I mean, we already have public participation in there. I'm just giving the public another way to participate. I agree so with I'm, that. I'm not changing anything, um, but if you feel that there's changes that need to be made to BDD, then I would ask that that be brought forward at the May meeting. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to have it come forward that we amend a policy to allow public comment via email. Mr. Hendricks, just a point of clarification. You're asking to amend the policy, which means you have to wait until the end of the meeting, pose an agenda yeah. item for the future to actually discuss on possible action can't do it during the middle of a meeting where we haven't even brought that up. Correct. Fine, then we'll do it at the end of the meeting, Mr. Thank Farr. Thank you. And just uh, by way of clarification, anytime there is a policy change, and I think this is what you were alluding to, it requires two reasons. Yeah. So there would have to be uh, a meeting where the policy was presented. Uh, if there were any changes, then it would have to come back for a second meeting and be approved by the board. Correct. Yeah. So do, yeah, we have a first reading in May and a second reading possibly in June. Yeah. 
All right, so we don't need to take action on that. We'll discuss it at the All right, discussion and possible action regarding a resolution concerning the financing of equipment for schools, including without limitation school buses, support vehicles, student textbooks, and instruction materials, electronic or otherwise. Directing the Executive Director of Operations to notify the Lyon County Debt Management Commission of the district's proposal to issue general obligation bonds and one or more series in the maximum aggregate principal amount of six million five hundred thousand, authorizing the executive director of operations or the superintendent to arrange for the sale of bonds, providing certain details and connection therewith, and providing the effective date hereof. This item is being presented by executive director of operations, Armand Banks, and principal service officer Kyle Rogers. Mr. President, members of the board. So, for item number sixteen in front of you, we are seeking to go back out to bonds for six and a half million dollars. Um, as the resolution states, this is for the purchase of vehicles, buses, curriculum, and um, I believe a couple of other things. But the two main things that we're going to be going for with the six and a half million dollars is going to be transportation buses um, and for the purchase of curriculum. Um, the reason we're bringing this forward right now um, is twofold. One is currently we do not have the bonding capacity for a big per big build uh, for a big uh, project like a school until 2027. The second reason is our debt service fund, which is uh, a fund which can only be used to pay off debt is um, flush. So um, it doesn't make sense to continue increasing that fund if we have no debts to pay off. And that is why we're bringing forward um, six and a half million for uh, this project. Um, another, Point of uh, notification is this will be a medium term bond. Therefore, by 2027, when we have the capacity to build a new school or whatever this board and um, proposes that we go um, build, uh, th these bonds will be paid off. So we will have a very flush debt service fund along with the least amount of debt obligations in 2027. And we can again go out and build and go out for. We're open any questions you might. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Parsons, do you have a question? Comment. Um, I am a little concerned. I felt like it was the amount of money that we're going to get from the state was a little rosy. I mean, that means there's everything going as well as it is right now. Is what you proposed on your thing and on your what you showed us and Parsons, i don't think we're i mean that that was the whole uh discussion on in a closed session so let's not discuss that in this new one we can't discuss that no no oh, okay well all right uh, that's a, well that was just my comment i just felt like it was a little right <clears throat> So what are they there for if we can't suggest it? We're discussing um, issuing the bonds for six and a half million to pay for certain items. Oh, okay. Let's see. Okay. Um, all right. So um glad that we could have this item brought forth to us. I did when I first started reading, I was a little nervous because it's you know it's it can be difficult if you take out a bond for something whose lifespan expires before the bond. But then when it said it was um, a medium note that's going to get paid off in 2026, I was like, okay, that's that's great. Like I'm on board for that. Um, and so that won't affect our bonding capacity at all in 2027. Um, and then that short time frame, we can pay that off and use that money wisely. So I agree that that's a great move. Thank you. Mr. Hendrick. So you talk about a um, a fund here, a, a debt management fund, debt service fund, yeah. debt service fund. Okay, so, and that the only function of that fund is to pay debts. Correct. So it can't be used for any other item or anything. Nope. And in issuing these bonds, we're not um, saying what they're going to be spent on. So for that to be spent on any particular item that has to come back before the board? Yes, and we are we are indicating. So when we go out for bond monies, we must indicate what, what our intentions are for the money. 
Therefore, that's why in the recommendation you see um, a maximum average percentage of about six and a half million for um, school buses, support vehicles, student textbooks, and instructional materials, electronic or otherwise. So we must indicate that. So it will go towards school buses, support vehicles, student textbooks, or instructional materials. We are just we just haven't brought forward what exactly those buses, support vehicles, and materials are yet. When those come forward, yes, you will be approving those for purchase. And then the those things are currently funded through the general fund. Yes, they're currently funded through the general fund, and over the past three years, we've also used some effort funding as well. So those funds that will be available if we approve this in the general fund, because now they're going to be paid for out of this bond measure. Uh, where those monies are used will also come before the board. It will come before the board in a, in a manner of the final budget. Yeah. Yeah, the budget. Okay. So we're not just giving you six and a half million dollars to go out and spend. You're you're going to come back before this board and ask us on each specific item with a dollar value associated with it as to where it's going to go. Mr. Hendricks, I can't spend any money without the board's approval. So everything comes before you. So yeah, I just, just want to make that clear for everybody. Thank you. Mr. President, yes, Mr. I uh, make a motion that the board approve a resolution, a resolution, excuse me, uh, directing the executive director of operations to notify the Lyon County Debt Management Commission on the district proposal to issue general obligation bonds in one or more series in the maximum aggregate principal amount of $6.5 million, authorizing the, authorizing the executive director of operations or the superintendent to arrange for the sale of bonds and providing the effective. Thank you, Mr. Farr. So All right, so I have a motion by Mr. Farr and a second by Ms. Peterson. At this point, I will ask for any public comment. All right, seeing none, any further board comment? Just just one, Mr. Okay. President. Um, just making sure that the, um, under this plan, the estimated funding imbalance is still above our 25% balance threshold. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to make a quick comment, too. So I know, uh, you know, there was, there was a time in this district where we didn't buy any school buses for a number of years because of the hard financial times. That's 2008 through about 2000, probably 16, 17. And then uh, the district started prioritizing money to buy new buses. So seeing this money being used um, for the possibility as you guys bring agenda items forward for new buses, um, I think that that would be a great um, add for the transportation department. So I'm happy to see that. So thank you very much. Any further board comments? All right, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, it passes seven to zero. All right, item number 17, discussion and possible action regarding district-wide building controls and HVAC upgrades. This item is being presented by Executive Director of Operations, Harmon Bain, and Operations and Maintenance, Kirk McCallum. Mr. President, members of the board, for item number 17, we're bringing forward a whopping $4.6 million to be spent on capital projects throughout the district. Um, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna begin with some HVAC projects. As you may remember, last October, um, I, correction, last June, um, myself and Mr. McCallum came forward for the purchase of equipment to be replaced at DHS, SHS, and DES. Um, that equipment has arrived. Unfortunately, we went out in October for um, the installation of this new equipment. And the bids we received were well above budgeted amounts. And later on, both contractors, which we which we had awarded these um, projects to, have um, backed out and are unable to perform this project over the summer this year. So, um, because of that, we've been in communication with Train. Train is uh, a company that we purchase all our equipment from, so they know exactly what we have in our buildings at all times. And um, they are also through Omnia Partners, a installer and designer of all these projects because um, 
we all know our buildings are very old and it's not a simple task for any mom and pop shops to come in and do. So uh, we've been in communication with them and for the DHS, FHS, and DES um, equipment installation. And for the Sutro Elementary School where we sit today and Cottonwood Elementary School new equipment purchase design and installation. So that is the first piece that we're bringing forward um, in this uh, agenda item is the approval of train for those four schools. Um, second piece is just our continued um, attack of building control. Um, this is the final list for our building control. This list is probably going to take about a year, year and a half, if we're lucky, to complete. But it will get uh, BCS on board and in our schools and shipping away until they get it completed. So this is just bringing that forward as well for board approval so we can get them locked up before prices continue to go up or they find different projects to work on and we're kind of in a tough spot again. So we're open to any questions you might have. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Parson, do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. Not really. Okay. Um, this is just for everybody. How soon will this start? Um, we plan to have some of this started over the summer this year. So our first priority is gonna be DHS, FHS, and DCS. Uh, we, the equipment's already been purchased, so we have the equipment minus one piece, which we're expecting to have um, later next month, and uh, they're going to get slowly working on it. For Sutro and Cottonwood Elementary School, the equipment must be purchased, so we're waiting at least a year for that equipment to be purchased and brought in, and then hopefully next summer they'll be able to uh, begin that project as well. The most complaints I had were from SES, and so when is SES going to be started? I'm not sure what start, what are we trying to start at SES? Air conditioning or is that what train does, right? Air conditioning. So correct. It, so FES is getting a system too, right? Yes. So FES is on the list. We've been doing building controls at FES um, but throughout. You didn't answer the question approximately when it starts. I couldn't tell you. We don't have one. Schedule come out this week or the first part of next week to go through the two stores that are at FES. Um, anything that they find is wrong, we're going to address that and get it repaired. Okay. So, so FES also has a chiller. Um, both Sutra and Conway Elementary Schools have swamp coolers, so they they tend to give us far more issues than chillers do. Chillers do go down, parts go bad. And we're able to find those parts and replace them. Well, no, like swamp coolers where we have, we're kind of just out of luck. Something wrong last year, big uh, time, because I heard a lot of complaints. Correct. Mm -hmm. Ms. Kelly. Yes, Mr. Farr. Uh, Ms. Parsons says yes, and then you gentlemen as well. I actually taught in a classroom at FES that was affected heavily by it. And we were told repeatedly. Oh, the parts are on order, the parts are on order, the parts are on order, and then nothing. And then luckily we got out of the plus 400 degree temperatures and moved into where it was able to with swamp coolers and other things augment that. So I understand Ms. Parsons' concerns because I experienced them firsthand. And I do, yes, I understand you have a list you want to follow. And I understand this board made the wise decision, assuming as a result of those tax situations, slide the school calendar to accommodate the temperatures. But I would like to see a more forthcoming maintenance list in the future. And what, what we know, we're going to spend this amount of money. Um, I, I heard everything from waiting on parts that are possibly coming from China that may take forever to get here to everything else. So you can understand my trepidation when I say I, I would like to hear a concrete plan that includes a date. And, in the and Ms. Farr, we would love to provide that. If we, if we can, we'd love to provide the list. But a lot of this, a lot of this equipment is kind of it's working today and it's working great for the past 20 years, and all of a sudden it goes bad, and now we can't find it. So this list is very fluid. We'll we'll provide you the best list that we can. You know, I believe we have provided a building controls <laughs> list. Um, as for FES specifically, last year we were bored, and like just like the equipment here, it takes significant amount of time for anything to come um, with regards to that. But I, we absolutely understand your frustration. It is the same frustration we have. 
along with every other individual in the city. Well, I don't want to respond to that. I, I understand we, we spend large amounts of money at a school district for maintenance and for support personnel and for teachers and everything. I would just put this in the back of your mind to keep that in, in, in regard to the whole situation. When a classroom is 85 degrees, you know how hard it is to keep kids motivated and keep them focused on the subject matter? Hey, even keep them awake? That's a difficult thing to deal with. And especially when parents have questions, they don't go to the administrator, they don't go to Mr. Workman. They come and ask you, you have no answer. And I had children, parents ask me honestly, should I keep my kid home? That's your decision to make. I can't advise them whether they should keep their child at home, but you understand that, that that trickles down. So I'm looking at it from a student and a safety perspective. Absolutely. Uh, I, have a, I have a question if everyone yeah, else um, is done. Mr. Hendricks? Yeah, uh, the two contractors that we had that we no longer have, uh, uh, you stated that one of those uh, wouldn't accept the award because of internal reasons, and the other one because they couldn't finish the job over the summer as necessary. Yet, training, we're talking about a year, year and a half for them to finish it. So, incorrect, sir. Um, for DHS, FHS, and DES, is what we awarded those two contractors for, and training has uh, agreed to be able to do that work this summer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And for Sutro and Cottonwood, we are seeking um, training so they can begin purchasing the equipment, which will take a year at best to get here, and hopefully be able to attack that next summer. That's why we're bringing it forward as early as we are. Okay, so the three original contracts that were bit, but bid, um, will be done this summer. That is good. Quite yeah. right. Okay. Um, so you stated you don't have a start date. Um, we don't have a completion date. Um, Correct. We, we do not. Um, so, we're waiting for approval and we're waiting for the last piece of the equipment to arrive. Okay, because those are typically crucial parts of a contract. You know, you, you have a start date, you have a completion date so that everybody knows when things are going to be done and we can plan for the future. Uh, so that you're saying that's based on equipment arrival? Correct. We, we are waiting on a piece of equipment to still show up. Once that equipment shows up, we'll be able to sit down and, and discuss a schedule for when they can begin and complete the job. Like, it's not it's not in their hands to when the equipment shows up, just like it's not in ours. So we're just waiting on delivery. Okay, so I ask about train being the only contractor and you, I believe you said that they were not the only one that, that was involved in this process, or they were, are the only one? Um, so we, we are recommending approval through Omnia Partners. Omnia Partners is sim similar to SourceFlow. Um, they go out nationwide for cooperative bid contracts, and um, Train is a member of Omnia Partners. And they basically, the best way to explain it is they go out and say, hey, we want this type of work what's your best price for it, right? And anybody can piggyback off that price. And um, so that's exactly what Train has done. They've, they've provided a price to Omnia Partners along with everybody else nationwide. We've selected Train off, off that list. So in a, when doing so, we, we're, um, as a public entity, we can piggyback and not have to go out to bid. Truthfully, going out to bid hasn't been very fruitful for us to begin with on these costs. So did they show you any other bids or did the only one they provided was trained bid? We we were in contact with train. So but Omni secured other bids for this work? No, no, no. Omni is a cooperative agreement, I guess, company. So they get millions of different companies, millions of different products that people bid on. So what Ultimately, you decide to select one of them, similar to source. So in the past, we've brought forward SSI, and they're they're the ones that we go for with our flooring for our gymnasium. We piggyback off source well pricing, um, which allows us to get the best pricing, and it doesn't. Um, it, it it's really beneficial for rural because it 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 locks in the pricing that we would get along with the pricing that a washer would. Get. 
it doesn't impact us because we're all the way out here. Okay. So this is similar to that. All right. Is there a fee that we have to pay on me? Nope. Okay. Uh, the, the last question is, there are a number of uh, exclusions in all of these contracts with the control systems, with train, so, and the, go ahead. So the two, two main exclusions are the roof and the building controls. We've already completed the building controls. So um, while that's an, inclusion on, that's an exclusion on train's part, it's already been completed on the district's part. And the other piece is the roofs. We wanted to bring this forward as fast as possible. We weren't able to get a roofing quote um, in time for the board of meeting. Uh, we have uh, we have now, and um, that will be included uh, with train. So it was it was just an exclusion in order to make this meeting. Uh, there is some roof work required in order to crane out the current equipment. Okay, so it's included in the price you stated here, or it will be an additional cost. It will be an additional cost. And it's at a, at a roughly 55,000. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks for all the hard work. And uh, I mean, in this environment, it's hard to get contractors to come out to Lyon County and do work. So it's not like uh, you can just, you know, get on the phone and call three, four contractors to come out. We're lucky that we have one that's going to do the work this summer. So I think that that's great. Seeing if we're done with board discussion, I'll ask for public comment if there is any. Yes, sir. Um, so I was looking at these two companies. Come up here and say your name, please. James Whistler. So I was looking at the two companies on this. Um, BCS on the Triple B Better Business Bureau has a rating of A+. Plus. Train was the only one I could find that has a rating of F. 431 complaints closed in the last three years, 172 of that in the last 12 months. I don't think it's right that $3.2 million is spent on a company who can't even get BBB rated. If BCS or any other company can do it, if BCS can do the same work the train was going to do, combine that, maybe save a million or two, then that budget, could it not go to the Urington softball field? There's a way for all of this to happen. This is the public's money, taxpayer money going into all of this. It is only right that we, the taxpayers, have a say in which companies are done, and that's why we do want more companies. I understand it can be tough out here, but I'm sorry, a company that doesn't even get a triple B rating, that's a waste of money, because who is the guarantee how long that gear will last before we have to get another company to fix the stuff that's broke. I don't, I know with my background, I'm not giving money to a company that has bad business to have a helicopter end up in the dirt with dead people. These kids don't need to be sitting in there with the fans. I've heard those fans, those things sound like helicopters coming up over a hill. You can't hear the teachers. And, and most of us can tell it's hot in here. Like <laughs> we know the ACs need fixed for the for the summer times and the spring time, but we got to find somebody else that has a better business bureau rating that can guarantee all the work and not waste our money. Because I'd hate to see us back here in a year or two discussing the same thing, trying to get new equipment to fix the stuff that we just blew three point two million dollars on. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any uh, further public comment? Um, yeah, I'd like uh, Harmony or uh, somebody to come back up and explain to us that they did is why they didn't do any investigation on these companies. Because they've really got in their way. I mean, I believe Train is currently doing, I mean, they've done projects in our district for years, correct? Our entire, I want the entire. The majority of the equipment in our district is trained. Um, they are probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest, HVAC company and equipment supplier um, in the nation. I I did not do a better bureau 
Homestead or Business Bureau review search prior to that. We've also, as I explained, we've gone out the bid, and I don't know what those companies were on the Veterans Bureau business reviews, but they backed out. So I, I don't know how to answer that question. Yeah. No, I think that was, Maybe we ought to try to get a couple more if see they've really got it. Miss Brady, and I think Miss Parsons, I believe they've already tried to get additional bids. It's in our board packet talking about why these other companies didn't want to bid on the project. I'm sure that they're Thank you. All right, Ms. Peterson. Yeah, um, I'm, if I'm the partners, I'm the partners like Sourcewell. I'm assuming they have some kind of process where contractors or whomever put in a bid or statements or some kind of um, guarantee of work to be allowed to be in this Omnia partners. That's what I'm assuming. Correct. Am I correct? Correct. Yeah, and I would assume if they had a bad reputation that they wouldn't be in that contract and be contracting out with government entities. So. Well, um, I understand that the way most of the big businesses are doing it now is you do have to redo your electrical, but you know how they put the units in, and then you never have a whole school go down. The most you would ever have go down is like one unit at a time. And that's how the big buildings are going now. So maybe we ought to look into something like that because they're not that expensive. And so if they've really got enough rating, I think we need to look at something else. All right. I'm looking for a motion. Unless. Anybody want to make a motion? I'll make a motion, Mr. President, that we approve the recommendation by Mr. Bain for the recommended quotes from building control service to upgrade building controls for million two hundred ninety seven thousand three point five and train to design purchase and solve new equipment for three point two eight seven million. Um and of course, then of course we would need to revisit this when we look at the whooping cost per Mr. Bain's recommendation. I mean. I'll second. All right, so I got a motion uh, by Mr. Parr and a second by Ms. Peterson. Any further uh, board discussion? Uh, I myself would like to see a start and a completion date. We 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 can hire to provide starting on this. Not at this time, I understand. Okay. See no further board discussion. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye opposed. Nay. I pass to five to two. All right. Uh, item number 18, discussion and possible action regarding Arrington Elementary School YES playground upgrades, including a funding commitment from the YES parent teacher organization. And the Lyon County School District, this item is being presented by Executive Director of Operations, Harmon Bain, and Operations and Maintenance Supervisor, Kirk McCallum. Mr. President, members of the board, um, for, for this item, we are bringing forward um, the request made by the Arrington Elementary School Principal, Shannon Coombs, along with their parent teacher organization. They, they've been working on raising money for a playground project. And um, they're seeking, they're, they've made a commitment of $30,000 and are seeking the district to make a commitment of $20,000 for this playground project. This will be a YES PTO playground project. Um, we would just be donating. They are continuing to raise other funds as well. So there are no contractors or there's no schedule that I can share with you at this point. Um, they're basically just looking for a funding commitment. Uh, traditionally in Lyon County, we have used residential construction tax funds to support our playground district-wise. Unfortunately, the Earrington High School lighting and bleacher upgrades have drained that fund for Earrington, and therefore we are recommending that we still make this commitment, but make it out of our um, building and sites capital fund, which uh, does have the ability to make the commitment. We're open to any questions you might have. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Uh, any 
discussion from the board. Uh, Ms. Parsons, do you have anything I'll ask you? No, to... I'd just like to make a motion that I well, think. Well, hold on. We're not ready for a motion. Yeah, I, I, I have a comment. I, I realize we don't have a contractor. We don't have a starting time. We don't have an ending time. So we're just. We, we are not responsible for this project. We are just making an obligation as in a manner of donation to the project. To the project. We're making a donation. In, in, in a manner, yes. we're making a financial commitment of $20,000. I'm all for providing the playground. I have a certain order of things that I have in my mind. So thank you. I think there any further uh, board discussion. Bring that I'll open it up for any public comment. Right, okay, I'm looking for a motion. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, give to the PCA the twenty thousand dollars, which isn't even matching what they're what they've got. So I think we're getting a deal. PTO, PTO. All right. So I got a motion by Ms. Parsons and a second by Mr. Farr. Any further board discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 All right, passes seven to zero. And at this point, I'm going to take a five minute break.
All right, thank you. To item number 19, discussion and possible action regarding a four day school week. This item is being presented by YHS teachers Jennifer Smith and Nicole LaFleur. So, I want to give a little background on this item. Uh, these two teachers reached out to me via email to put this on the agenda. And so I accommodated them and we're uh, hearing this, their proposal tonight. So, thank you. Go ahead. Oh my God, you got to turn this thing on. Oh my God. Okay, well, let's start again. Good evening, members of the board. Good evening to the community at large and my school members. I appreciate you all being here tonight. I am Jennifer Smith from Arrington High School. This is my colleague, Nicole LaFleur, who will be running through those slides for us this evening. We are here to talk to you about the four day school week proposal, which I prefer to call just a little bit of inspiration. Because folks, what we are currently doing is simply not working. And we need to start thinking outside of the box. Right now, what research is showing is that the number one job of any school is to provide quality education. What we see is that the four day school week inspires your teachers to not only plan with greater intention, but to also plan with greater focus. What we are also seeing is an insignificant academic performance shift. It is incredibly slight, and what that might be mostly due to is the COVID effect. The reason that quality time is improved in the four-day week is because your teachers do their planning far more intentionally and with far more focus. They cut out all the fat, they cut out all the waste, and just simply get down to business. This also allows your teachers more collaboration time not only horizontally within their grade level, but also vertically up and down the grade levels, which is gonna set our students on the exact trajectory that we would like them to have. It also allows for more training and development for your paraprofessionals to work more effectively in the general education classroom and work more closely with the general education teacher. What research is also showing is that it is not the number of days that we are in the classroom. It is the number of hours and the quality of instruction. What research has shown us is that students at the secondary level need to be in their chairs getting receiving instruction for a minimum of 31.03 hours a week. Now, if you're like me and you don't do numbers, you might wanna just think about that as 31.5, okay? Now I've been listening tonight and I can address some of our biggest concerns. Because you see, the four-day school week reduces bullying. It reduces violence. It has been shown to increase the mental and emotional health of our students. It also creates a more positive school environment. It also reduces all of the stress in your teachers. It increases family time. It increases the actually the number of study hours that students put in. It also reduce, reduces our students' stress and makes them more amenable to showing up for school activities. So as we're looking at this, we see another problem. We see a problem with teacher hiring and teacher incentives. I do not know if you looked at today's posting, but as of this moment, Lyon County School District has 139.5 unfilled positions and we have very few applicants. The reason we have very few applicants is because we are surrounded in Northern Nevada with schools on the four day week. Every school in 1A North and 2A North divisions are on a four day school week calendar. If not this year, they will be by next year, which means that on Fridays, our games are being moved even earlier. If you go to your high schools on Fridays, you are going to see absenteeism off the charts. What happens is all of our athletes leave to go to games, their spectators leave, their siblings leave, Many of our coaches are also teachers, so we also have a shortage of staff. We are facing a severe substitute teaching shortage. So many of your teachers are filling in their preparation periods by going into other classrooms and teaching, which is also costing the district money by paying us extra hours. When teachers have that extra day off, believe it or not, they actually spend a lot of time in reflective practice Teachers tend to take care of all their business appointments, which also reduces your needs for substitute teachers. They actually do spend more time planning and reflecting. 
further, I'd like you to just think for a moment about teacher retention. Take myself for an example. I am slated to retire in two years. I am a 34 year old, 34 year teaching veteran. If you offered me a four day week with how much I love my job, might I stay? It's very possible because the only reason I have to retire is that I am tired and I'd like a little more personal time. And that can be easily alleviated by saying, Ms. Smith, you can now have a four day week. Wouldn't that be grand? You can not only hire teachers, but you could actually retain some of us. We have no incentives to offer new hires. And what we are currently doing, if you look at our open position list, is obviously not working. It is time to think outside the box. You want to improve staff morale. You want to improve school spirit. Move to a four-day week. If you actually read all of the research that you were sent, you will see that the positives far outweigh the negatives. I realize that we are a very small rural district, but guess what? That's exactly what the four-day week has been designed for. Also, we may have seen problems in the past, but I want you to think of every single thing that was erased during COVID. We solved all of the problems about meal delivery, child care, and transportation through COVID. And we have several district plans that we can look at for more inspiration. So we're looking at improved morale, improved school spirit, improved attendance, reduced stress, healthier students, happier teachers, better retention. I can't think of anything that's negative that's happening here. So I'm gonna encourage you to think outside the box because what we are doing is simply not working. A school district can save between two and 7% by moving to a four day school week. And that really depends on what we choose as communities to do with that fifth day. Because you see, it really is up to the community. This is not a cookie cutter, one size fits all approach. There are many districts that run both four and five day weeks. This is not outside the norm. It is becoming the regular. What would we do with those Fridays? Well, let's think. We could be running Friday school. Now, our academically at risk kids could be coming to school on attendance contracts with a licensed teacher, with our paraprofessionals sitting in support of those students in one to three or one on one groups. Wouldn't that be a boon for our at risk students? be able to build those relationships in our school community and at the same time get academic help? What about running some open gyms and having all of our family events on that fifth day? You want some community involvement? Well, let's give some time to have some community involvement. Your teachers would really like to be involved, but after we have spent the entire day in our classrooms, to come back in the evenings can be quite, well, stressful for us. But if you offered us a time when we could come and just be people with our students and our families, imagine what we could do. You were talking about providing mental health services. When might that happen? Why not on Fridays? Why can't we open up our school to provide services to our children in transition and our families who are really hurting in our communities? Why can't we use those Fridays to build that community relationship that Lyon County School District is supposed to be all about? What about some community workshops and some mentoring for our students? Why can't we draw from our retired people in our community to come in and give our kids some building trade skills, to give our kids some automotive skills, to give our kids some interviewing and application skills, to give our kids some job skills, something that they can actually do. This would be so powerful for that at-risk community of our schools, it would knock your socks. So my whole purpose here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is simply to inspire you to start thinking outside the box. The time is right. Our hiring list right now will tell you very clearly that what we are currently doing is simply not working. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, um, like to open it up for uh, board discussion. Obviously, I believe that, you know, I mean, I appreciate the presentation, but switching to a four day school week is not something at least that I'm prepared to do tonight. So I think that, you know, many meetings would have to take place and, you know, because obviously we have different, we have several different communities within our district. I mean, you were talking about the 1A, 2A, 
Um, obviously, we have some of our schools on the 3A, so you know a lot of our teams here in Dayton and Burnley are competing with Reno schools that are still on a five-day school week. So I understand your point about the 1A, 2A, but that might only apply to a few of our attendance areas. So, Which is also why I stated that it's not a cookie-cutter approach. This is not a one-size-fits-all. It has to be designed for the actual community involved, all right? If yep. anybody ever showed up at Yarrington High School on a Friday, they might see that I am a senior teacher that has six people in a class that's supposed to have 23 on a basic Friday. So really, my attendance isn't even covering my salary on a Friday. I'm just letting you know. All right. Now, I'm very familiar with Yarrington High School. I've had both of my parents uh, graduated there and my grandfather uh, taught at Yarrington High School. So I'm, Come on down. Visit us sometime. We'd love to see a board member in our school. It would be grand. I'm there all the time. Yeah, it's just there. Okay, perfect. Um, so, obviously, I appreciate your presentation. Um, I'll open it up for uh, for discussion at this point. Uh, I'd like to go if I well, yeah. I don't want to. I know Ms. Parsons. Oh yeah, go ahead, so. Ms. Parsons. This is um, hard for me because I don't think I've ever not voted for what the teachers want. And I don't know if it's just, you know, you and another woman or if it's the teachers in general, but um, I just think our kids have gone through so much. I just don't think another change would be good for them right at this time. They are uh, um, fragile. I mean, every other month we're looking at a new service we have to give to them. So uh, I have to vote no for this, but I appreciate it. And I do know all the positive. Um, I was just telling somebody, my granddaughter decided to do her student teaching in Wells. Why? Because it's a four day week. And they're on the block system. So she only teaches two days a week and she substitutes in Elko the other three days. And so she's made money while she did her student teaching. So I know there are advantages to the teachers and to uh, people, you know, who are doing student teaching, but I just don't think I was looking at the data and 0.6 and then for boy, girl, 0.4 for uh, boys, but that doesn't include the accumulation of point, let, averaging 0 0.5, 0 0.5 every semester at the end of uh, when they graduate, it's going to be between six and 12 points. The research in Colorado that has been done since they started in 1973. Hey, will at, at, I, at this point, we're just doing board discussion, so I'm just going to have the board discuss it. I think that you're right that Colorado would be the perfect place because I have a feeling, I know we've vacationed there a lot of times, and it, they have a lot of money during, so they have a lot of off time. And so that would be the perfect place for this. I could see that working in Colorado. But if you notice the data, I don't know if you would sent the data against it. It's like rural communities like Burington, who it's particularly bad for. So, and you can see, what do the kids have to do um, on their day off? Maybe the boys and girls club, but that's about it. Okay, I think that's it. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fox? I actually tipped quite a bit on this to address. Number one, I can see both sides of the argument. I can understand that for secondary education, this might make sense to you. For primary education, it's a disaster, and it has been proven nationwide to be a disaster. It does not help. Look, student, younger students don't do well with longer school days, Monday through Thursday. There is no 
minimal. There's a, it's almost a wash with the savings that come into play when you have to keep a building open for five days because you still have teachers that work on that fifth day. I know this because they come from Battle Mountain where they have a four day work week. Everybody at the high school level loves it. You ask everybody below that, they can't stand it and wish they would have changed back a few years ago because it works great for high school. It's horrible for younger students. Test scores are horrible. Their retention is horrible. The fact that parents are now burdened with providing childcare on a Friday. We've actually explored this in Lyon County in the past and held community engagement events and held town halls. And the overwhelming response from parents was, no, we don't want this. I, I can go on and on, but I'm going to tell you right now, I will never support a four-day work, a four-day school. Ms. Peterson. Yeah. Um, you know, at first glance, it sounds great. And I, I actually agree with Mr. Farr. Um, I have lots of athletes in my family, and they've missed schools on Fridays. And it's a pain. If you have to go in, you have to talk to the teacher, you have to get the work. And I realize that it's hard and they've missed out. Um, but when I think about how that compares to how many kids are in the schools and need to be there, um, I have real concerns for the little people, actually. Um, we learned through COVID that kids need to be in school in person. Um, they do best that way. And we had a, we've had a lot of you know mental health problems and we're still filling those gaps in the academics. Um, coming out of that. And so I personally um, think that they just need to stay in school five days. Thank you. All right, any, any further uh, board discussion at this point? If not, I will open it up for public comment. Anybody wishing to make public comment? Yes, James Whistler. Um, I do like what she did say. There are some benefits. Um, I remember when I first joined the military, they did the same thing. Four day work week, work 10 hours a day. Hey, that was great for us, you know. But on the other hand, child support or child daycare. What are you going to do? A lot of families are working two full parents. How are we going to take care? We cannot have these kids running around wild and rampant. Most daycares will not do one day. And if you get lucky enough to find someone that will, some of these daycares is like, yeah, we'll give you the one day, but you still have to pay for the whole month. Parents can't afford that. On top of that, any of the teachers, single family teachers, what are they going to do? Because they still have to work. They still have to prep for the next day, and not all of them are going to get time at home. So I'm glad the board sees some of this, but I wanted some of the other folks to know that those are things that we have to consider is daycare and other provisions for these kids. Because Boys and Girl Club, they can't take all these kids and many places, Dayton, I know is one of them, where it's a hit and miss, 50-50 uh, chance of getting your kid on there each and every day. So thank you. Thank you. All right, any uh, further public comment on this item? All right. So at this point, um, it is for possible action, so it doesn't look like anybody's ready to, I mean, unless you guys have some direction for obviously i mean this is uh like i kind of started my comments you know this is i mean a big deal for our district and not something that i think would be taken lightly by anybody um and i think that you know at a minimum we would have to have many town halls in our attendance areas to get many voices so you know i'm i'm not sure that i'm prepared to do that i mean hearing some of the comments on the board um you know, me personally, I could be, you know, I mean, I see good good and bads with all of it. Um, obviously, I don't see the 2 to 7% savings because the majority of our budget is um, salaries. And so the only way you're going to get the 2 to 7% is through the classified um, folks in the district, and that's about it. Um, obviously, the certified are going to make uh, the same amount of money supplies and everything else for the school buildings and all the other costs. I mean, the only way you're going to get savings is by having your bus drivers drive four days and your lunch people four days. And I mean, if we think we have a hard time now trying to find people that we can promise them five days of work instead of four days of work, I mean, we'd have a problem. So that's another thing we didn't even, I didn't even bring up is that we have a lot of our students that basically on Fridays, you know, I had two two kids in my class, they got backpacks full of meals to go home with because 
That was the only way we we're going to get nutrition to them. Kids, some of them, the two meals they, they can guarantee today are at school five days a week. Yeah, no, that's correct too. And I think that, yeah, we even saw that during COVID that, I mean, there was, there was definitely some problems out there. So yeah, you bring up a good point too, as far as having them go three days in between possibly getting food. So any further comments or if we don't have any action, we don't need to take any action. So I think we're good. All right, moving down to item number 20 for possible action discussion and possible action regarding revisions to policy BG, board staff communications in the second and final reading. This item is being presented by board member Darren Farr and Superintendent Wayne Workman. So this is a second and final reading of this policy. I mean, Mr. Workman, could you read the changes? Uh, yeah, they're the same ones that were presented last board meeting. So there are no new changes for this second reading. So it reflects all the changes from the very first reading that are exactly if the you same. you have it in front of you, could you read it for Mr. McIntyre? Oh, I apologize. I'm sorry, I apologize. I don't have it. Oh, I can't find it. Right. Oh, you got it right there. Okay. Yeah. You Thank you. Doesn't have my changes in there. Would, would you like me to still read it or you just want to no, read it from there? Okay. I don't have anything further to add. We've read it before. Okay. So I, Holly is ready to make motion, I believe. There is, doesn't show my changes. Mr. We McIntyre, do you want me to hold off for a second? I was going to make a motion. Do you want me to hold off for a second? So you read that? I can open it up for public comment if anybody has any public comment on this item. Item number 20. So last month I wasn't able to attend. Sorry, James Whistler again. Uh, last month, I wasn't able to attend. I was on the night shift, so uh, I was able to watch it, though. And one thing I noticed, there was a comment that said a board member can use their power of position to intimidate a teacher. And it was my understanding that Mr. Hendricks wanted to make changes so a teacher could contact a board member and talk to them directly without the, su the superintendent's no way. Um, um, without him knowing about it. And when that comment was made, it kind of opened up a door for me because the superintendent has power as well. And any superintendent or anyone else in that position can also use their position of authority to, um, I'm blanking on the word, to, I guess you could say, intimidate, there it is, intimidate a teacher from talking to a board member, especially if it's on a subject that the superintendent has said yes on or something that they disagree with, with the superintendent or any other facilities. I'm only mentioning him because that's what was brought to light, but he too can use that power as anybody else can. So I only think it's reasonable that a teacher be allowed to talk to a board member without the superintendent knowing, because that is what we call the open door policy. Thank you. I don't, I'm not sure what meeting you were watching, but that wasn't the discussion of this item. So if, if you heard that comment, Mr. Whistler, my exact comments were I wanted to prevent the environment okay. that would create that situation okay. specifically. Yeah, I use those right. words. Yeah, yeah. Okay. we Thank want you. to prevent that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and this this board policy is official or formal communications. So official reports, official and formal communications. Going out to all staff, not you can't go talk to your board members. I, I, I'd like to clarify. I felt like notifying the superintendent whenever communication was done with staff was necessary. Okay. I just didn't want to have to ask his permission every time that I wanted to have a discussion about something or get clarification from staff. Okay. Mr. President, yeah. to be clear, this this is about official communication. You are not prevented as a board member from going to a staff member and talking to them or getting clarification. This policy is about official communication only. Any teacher, any staff member, they can go and talk to a board member anytime they wish. First of all, I don't have time to monitor everybody's communication with you. So that's that's item number one. Uh, number two, 
there is nothing that that in policy that allows me to prohibit any of that communication going back and forth. So I just want to make sure everybody understands for this policy, we are talking about official communications where, uh, for example, if a, if a district memo needs to go out, it just means that an individual board member can't send out that memo to the whole staff. That has to come through the office of the superintendent for that official communication to go to all staff. So that's what this policy is all about. Thank you. And my agenda items, as we all know, mainly concerned with our conduct as board members. Yeah. As, a, as opposed to the actual district employees themselves. Okay, well, I thank you for that clarification because I guess I didn't understand what official communication entailed. I thought that was any communication, which I, even when I do uh, communicate, I include you in the email. I CC you in so you're aware you know, when I'm emailing someone and asking a question, just good policy, I think. Okay. Any uh, further public comment? Seeing none, I'll close that. Looking for a motion. Mr. Mr. President? Yes. I would like to make a motion that the Board of Trustees approve policy DG board staff communications as a second and final reading. I'll second. All right, we have a motion by Ms. Lines and a second by Ms. Peterson. Any further uh, board comment? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, passes 7 0. Item number 21 discussion and possible action on agenda items for future board meetings and or information item requests, including a summary by the superintendent. Mr. Workman. Thank you, Mr. President. So our next Board meeting is scheduled for May 23rd. It will be at East Valley Elementary School starting at 6.30 p.m. For that, uh, the, the month of May is uh, per NRS is, is when we present the budget. So there will be a budget hearing uh, for the FY24 uh, final budget. Uh, we will also present the five-year capital improvement plan because it must match the budget. We will also provide a strategic plan update we will have the transfer VR presentation that was requested for this meeting, but the vendors weren't able to come. Uh, Ms. Member Farr requested that. Uh, so we have that set up for the May meeting. Uh, we will also have an update from uh, our nutrition services provider, Chartwell. Uh, more projects with the Cottonwood Elementary School and Silver Springs Elementary School, uh, excuse me, Silver Stage Elementary School multi purpose room roofs. Uh, we also uh, hope to have an update with the booth par field. Uh, that work continues in the background with Mr. Baines and Mr. McCallum. Um, additionally, uh, there will be a presentation about what are called Falcon restrooms for our athletic fields. So trying to solve that problem that was brought up uh, earlier. Um, we'll also have uh, an RFP. Uh, it's called a surfaces RFP. Um, I won't try and explain that now. There's a lot to it and more to come. And then uh, from earlier in the meeting, uh, the board policy BDD uh, with, with uh, suggested changes for allowing public comment via electronic submission. And then uh, that's what I have thus far for the May meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Workman. Uh, any further item requests? I think you did a pretty good job of recapping all that. So anybody else have anything further that they want to see on the May 23rd agenda? All right, thank you. At this point, I will open it back up for public participation. If anybody would like to come up and address the board at this time. Craig Clausen, Wellington, President Cooey, and Superintendent Workman. At the March 28, 2023, Lyon County School District Board of Trustees meeting, this board discussed student and teacher safety and how it may be improved. First, thank you, Trustee Parsons, for taking the lead, along with Trustee Hendricks, to bring proposals to this board. 
Since time is of the essence, I would also encourage this board to consider Sheriff Pope's proposal, K-9. This excellent suggestion has one critical advantage. Dogs can move around, stationary options cannot. I know Lyon County parents and citizens, as well as students and teachers, are most anxious to hear concrete next steps from this board. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in public participation? Just like to, I mean, address that comment that I believe I've seen uh, some social media posts that they are having. Uh, I think the dogs went through a few of our schools already, so that's that's a great thing. So, encourage that. It's a regular happening in yeah. the district for years now. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, any further public participation? All right, seeing none, we're adjourned.